And a pleasant good afternoon to everyone out there in Irish Breakdown land. I am Vince D'Addario. It says it right there. That's Brian Driscoll. It says it right there. Uh, and this is Friday, baby. It's the Friday free-for-all mailbag. So that means the show is in your hands, everybody. Put your questions in there, and we are going to answer pretty much every. And there's some gr- really good ones in here asking about Notre Dame, asking about Clemson of all places. Hey, that's what it is. Friday free-for-all means you can talk about everything. And just so you all know, we got to roll, get your questions in, because about 2.30, I got to end this, and I got (laughs) to finish packing, get in my car, drive to the airport, and I'm heading home today. So uh, appreciate all the prayers and everything for my mom and everybody that's been great. She's doing better. I've had a lot of people ask. She's doing a lot better. Uh, I think she was thinking about maybe faking an injury today to try to convince me to stay for a couple more days, but uh, <laughs> she decided not to do that, but she's doing good, and I know all the prayers help, so everybody appreciate that very, very much. Now, it's time. Let's talk some. Let's talk some. We can't yeah. say Notre Dame football. It's college football, baby. Yeah, baby. Right? If we got some questions in, it's college football, so let's get right. Whatever. Just bring it. Any topic. Yeah. Any topic. It's a free-for-all, baby. Yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. So you ready to rock and roll, Vince? I am always. You got to get Q Kibbs, my man Q Kibbs, Queen Kibbler. He's going to start us off, Vince. So let's get, let's get, let's go. Yep. He says, in all seriousness, because his his first question was, "All right, let's get the Dante Moore questions yeah, going." It, it was happy, happy Dante <laughs> yeah, Moore questions is. day. Yeah. And so then he follows it. He says, "In all seriousness, I heard Dante saying that it was key getting his mom on visits this spring since she hasn't been before. Is that a big key in closing? I, I mean, I don't. I'm not going to speak for him specifically." But getting mom involved and getting mom on board, I, generally that's a pretty important piece. Yes, uh, to make sure everything is going right. Because yes. I mean, you know, when happy life, happy wife, it's also you know happy mom, happy life. So uh, there's no, until you're married. It, it, this is exactly how it goes. It's happy mom, happy life. Then you get married. Then it's happy wife, happy life. Right? <laughs> that's like right. that's exactly how it goes, man. Best advice my dad gave me on the day I got married is he put his arm around my shoulder and he said pointed to my wife and he goes that's your family now you know yeah. what i mean but until that point in time <laughs> it was still mom and dad so darn right uh, but no in all seriousness for notre dame to cl- guys it's just keep doing what they're doing right yeah. that, that's the thing just just keep doing what they're doing you know they they've done a great job it's it's been it was tommy at first and chad bone was involved and now coach freeman is in there just you know closing it this staff has done a great job they're doing a great job with the team recruiting it's not just one coach anymore. You've right. got the individual position coaches. You've got the coordinator. Chad Bowden has basically been doing his best Vinny Serrato impersonation since he got to Notre Dame. Uh, and for you that are a lot younger than me, <laughs> that's an extreme compliment, right? Because yeah. it was Vinny Serrato that put together like three straight number one recruiting classes back when he was basically uh, uh, Lou Holtz's re- you know, recruiting, basically his recruiting coordinator. And then, of course, you finally have a head coach that – is working he embraces and, and recruiting not only does he embrace it but he's a really likable yeah. relatable yeah. guy kids love him parents love him because he's genuine so it's going great so just keep doing what you're doing right yeah. like there's no magic wand here right it's right. just keep doing what you're doing put and in the work do that and things will work out just fine so now look if it's if my if, you know for dante for the thing the thing with the mom that's more about dante that's more about dante just wanted to get you know mom up and Making sure. sure that you know all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and all that other kind of stuff, but you know that's really what it boils down to is just figure out figure out what you, you know what you need to do to feel comfortable to make this thing uh, you know finalize and then and then go from there and then that's going to be that's going to be the key. Absolutely. Got a little super chat here, Vince. Yeah, we do from John. Uh, thank you very much, John. Lysot. Should I go Lysot, you think, Brian? I'm mm-hmm. going to go with that one. He says, Sounds hey, guys. He goes, I'm getting married tomorrow. Congratulations, John. He says, I'm marrying a Longhorn fan. I'm sorry, John. Uh, give my bride three reasons to convert to the fighting Irish. Love the show. Prayers and good vibes are appreciated for the big day. Well, congratulations, John. Uh, let me tell you, your wedding day, it will go by so fast. At least in my in my experience, it went by so fast. It was like a blur. Mm-hmm. A wonderful blur. It was a great mm-hmm. day. Good save. But it Good went save. by so fast. Like, all of a sudden, it was over. Um, and so, good luck, dude. We, all, your prayers with you. As far as the three reasons to convert to Notre Dame, I mean, let's see. Where do, where do I begin? I mean, number one, I mean, I know that, you know, you're in Texas and everything, right? But, like, Texas is supposedly the state that's, like, the great American state, right? Holds true to American values. 
Notre Dame is America's team in college football. I mean, so that's Boom. number one. Love right. That. So, you know, make sure that you're not, you know, a communist. Number one, uh, Notre Dame's <laughs> mascot is not Notre Dame's mascot is not one that you can just easily flip upside down and turn it into a you know big loser. Uh, number three, uh, Notre Dame's not a bunch of sellouts. Notre Dame stays true to their convictions and they don't come running uh, to the SEC or whoever else whenever they get a nice enough offer. Uh, so they basically aren't the whores of college football, which is essentially what Texas has turned themselves into. And I'm probably get, you know, demonetized because these are whores, <laughs> but you know, basically that's what Texas has turned themselves into. So uh, we're now two questions in. I've already got us demonetized. I know, thanks, buddy. So at least, but hey, you know what? He gave the super chat, so that'll help. Yeah, but, uh, but no that's doubt. what Texas has turned themselves into. I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, Texas is constant chase of maximum dollar. Yes has caused them to say screw the tradition screw the history screw they do have history the rest of the game we're going to chase dollars to the sec knowing it's going to hurt us hurt our product on the field they're going to run and chase dollars that's what texas has turned themselves into no respect for their tradition the thing notre dame gets hammered for is they hold on too tight to their tradition sure and if i'm going to be one of two things that's i'm going to be the the loyal too loyal i'd rather be too loyal than you know, hey, I'll, I'll I'll love you for I'll love whoever gives me the most money, and that's what Texas is, and they've they, yeah, uh, that's why I would never be a Texas fan. So you you want to know that right there? I mean, really, you could just go with number three right there if you really want to get down with it. But Notre Dame um, had their own network before you know Texas did. Yeah, it's called Damn. NBC. Yeah, right, right, and it's not a lame network. You know, the Longhorn, the the Lamehorn network. So you know. <laughs> I'm glad we got that one. Yeah. I was worried I wasn't going to be here for that yep. one. So, uh, yep. No, no, I had I had to get that one in there, man. I had well to get played. that one in there. So let's get back. Let's get back to it. That was well played. John yeah. A1 uh, jumping in here. He always has the early questions. Mm-hmm. Justin Walters has a lot of players in front of him. Does he have a high enough ceiling to earn a rotation spot? I assume he's re- talking about this year. I personally think it's going to be tough. Now, yeah. is, is is it possible? Of course. I mean, it's possible. But bringing in Joseph, I think, pushed him back a little bit. Um, I mean, that it just – it's a numbers game, yeah, right? Yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. He's going to have to – I mean, he's going to have to climb over two of – just to get in the top four. Right. He's going to have to t- climb over two of Houston Griffith, right. DJ Brown, Xavier Watts, Ramon Henderson, and Brandon Joseph. Yeah, it's going to be tough. <laughs> that, yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a hard deal. But – from what I'm told, they still like Justin Walters. They they sure. love what he brings to the table. He's got some upside. He's still got to fill out his frame a little bit. But no, his future, I think, is still bright. It's just, you know, there's there's some veteran players there. I just now, don't think it's going to be in 22. That's all. Yeah. Now, he did get some special teams playing time this year. For me, if I'm Justin Walters, that's what I'm hoping for this year. Right. As, as someone who's would like to see Justin be successful, that's what I'm rooting for. I'm rooting for him to become a special team stalwart because if he's the player that I think he's going to be on special teams or I mean on defense, he's going to, he's, he should be really good on special teams. Mm-hmm. And if he can't lock down several special team spots this year, then that's going to tell me maybe he's not the guy that I think he is on, on defense. That's it's fair. So that's really what I'm looking for from Justin Walters this year. I want to see him starting on kickoff, punt return, punt, you know, all those type of things. And, and I think that's going to be a good sign for, for 2023 when they're definitely going to lose Houston Griffith and DJ Brown. And there's a chance they could also lose Brandon right. Joseph. Right. And that's three guys right there. Right. And then that opens right. the door right. for Justin Walter, especially if he has the year that we think he can have right. on special team. And I think, right. I think it's important for guys to understand, you know, again, it's spring and we haven't even had fall yet, but to understand what their role could potentially be and set your expectations accordingly. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. an expectation of being on every special team, it's a great expectation, yeah. and that's one that he can really fight and work for. Mm-hmm. And then if you succeed there, then next year you adjust those expectations. And I, and I think that that's important. He's still a young guy, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got he's got time, and he will make his mark on Notre Dame right. as long as he continues sure. to go that direction. Yeah, he's a good player. I mean, look, and I, and I like I like Justin Walters. I have not heard anything about him that doesn't make people think he's not going to be a player. Right. But it's just it's going to take time, and that's that's the big thing. And he he's going to need a big year because you know, next year you're going to have Peyton Bone and Don Schuler showing up to to battle. Good so point. It's it's going to be a, it, it, it it's not a big year for Justin in that he's got to get on the field or it's a disappointment. No, special teams wise, I'd say that's true, but safety wise, I'd say it's not. But it needs to be a year where he shows the staff enough progress to say, hey, 
you know what? Like we like this kid. We don't need to worry about searching the transfer portal. We've got right. Ramon. We got Xavier. We got Justin. We got the incoming freshman. Like we're going to be okay. Right. And and I think that's if you see if you're hearing about Notre Dame searching the transfer portal a year from now, it's going to be because Justin Walters isn't the guy that they think he is. Right. Or there's been a bad injury or two. So uh, it, it is a big year for him, but not so much on defense. It's just it's showing the progress that makes you say, hey, you know, we're 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 getting we're getting close to that point in time. K. Grant dropping the bomb today. Thank you very much, K. Grant. Really appreciate that uh, for the super chat. Thanks for the incredible intel earlier on the message board. That got me fired up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that's another reason you need to be on the message board, folks. Just saying. We, we dropped some intel. It's It's been three or four days since that intel dropped, and K. Grant is already is still fired up. <laughs> still fired up about that. Well, it was and, meat, it was meaty. There's still meat on yeah. that bone. Like there, there yeah. was a lot going on there. Well, we had a fun discussion last night because you know I had a, a friend of mine. It's funny. A friend of mine called me kind of panicking the other night, and he was like, "I'm really worried about recruiting." I said, "Wait, wait a minute, what?" And I said, <laughs> "Look, man, just don't worry. Just check out my intel piece on the board." And he's like, "I know. I just read it. That's why I'm worried." I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> and he, his concern was. I just thought this was going to be the best recruiting class Notre Dame has ever had, and I'm not sure they're going to get there. Like, that's the bar for him now. <laughs> it's the best He's ever. He's worried that it's not going to be the best recruiting class ever. Like, and, <laughs> okay. you know, because, you know, I mean, look, because we're honest, right? Like, one of the things we talked about is, like, I'm I'm not loving what's going on at DB right now. Like, I love what they already have, right? Justin Rett, Peyton Bowen, and Adon Schuler, But, you know, I'm 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 not locked onto the idea that, that OG Peyton Bowen is going to stay in this class. I mean, he – He's acting like a kid at times that likes Notre Dame but isn't in love with Notre Dame. Right. To the point where someone's gonna have to, you know, really convince him otherwise. I'm I'm not sold on that yet. I hope that I'm wrong because I think Peyton's a great player. I think he's a great fit for Notre Dame. I think he's a Notre Dame kid, but you know, as Marcus Freeman has said, sometimes we got to convince these kids that they're actually Notre Dame kids, right? And hopefully they can keep Peyton Bone in the class because he's a phenomenal player. Seems like a great kid. Yeah, absolutely. Just look, Texas is a hard place to get kids out of. And they still have to – that's right. They still have to do that. So, um, But, you know, I, I think that I, the other – but the, so there were some, you know, hey, we're not sure about this. But then we kind of were talking last night about, like, you know, what chance does this class have at really having one of the best Notre Dame classes of the modern era, right? Right. You know, like 80s to now. And it's it's on pace to be one of right. It's just now it's about closing and how well they close. And so we're, we we talked about all that kind of stuff. But you know that's the thing I love about the board is it's not always intel. Sometimes we're just we're just having good football conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And and that that's going to be the case. We got another one from from Quinn Kibler, Q Kid, the artist formerly known as Q Kibbs. <laughs> I love that. If you Brian and Vince could play on any Notre Dame team besides '88, which are you picking? Also, a position on the team. Well, I mean, that's an easy one. You're I mean, a quarterback. You're quarterback, yeah. I you're mean, the quarterback. There's yeah, no, no doubt about that. I Okay, so in high school, I played wide receiver in a triple option offense. So basically, I was an offensive tackle that was split out. Um, and then I also played free safety. So I really enjoyed free safety. It was a lot like playing center field and baseball. Uh, so I enjoy I'll, – I'll, I'll go defense. I'll say I want to pick off Brian's passes. Uh, and – <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that look on his face? Wow. Ouch. Uh, now, I would have needed to You keep to telling yourself that there, Chad. I would have needed to grow about a foot. Uh, but and other add than about that, three tenths to your 40-yard yeah. dash. <laughs> Just a little but other than that, yeah, buddy, you might have picked me off. I yep. used to be fast. Um, now, as far as Northern as, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Come down to the 757 and play high school football. We might have a different conversation. Oh, you're mean. Um, yeah. Hey, I could have gone NAIA, buddy. All right. Okay. I got letters. Okay. Because I was smart. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I don't know about what team, frankly, I'm, I would have played on any team and have been happy to run out of the tunnel with a golden helmet on, to yeah. be perfectly honest with you. Um, winning obviously is fun, but I would have taken any team whatsoever. It doesn't matter to me. Um, so I, I know that's not the answer you're looking for Q Kibbs, but, um, safety and then any, any team. I mean, the quarterback one's easy for me. It, it, look, it would, it would be an honor to have played at Notre Dame. And yeah. a privilege to have been able to go to an institution like Notre Dame. Um, so, I mean, I could take the easy route. But if I were to say, like, I would want have wanted to play for Lou Holtz. Yes, uh, that's, that's who fair. I would. That's I, fair. You know, just pick a team from eighty six yeah. to like ninety three. Yeah, right. Or eighty seven to ninety three. I would have wanted to play on any of those teams, right? And you know, like, 
I've gotten to know some of the guys that played on the from the '90 to '93 eras, you know, and, and mm-hmm. they're great dudes. Like, I think th- those would have been fun teams to be a part of. Like, just really good guys. Like, I've gotten to know Reggie Brooks, like away from the Notre Dame right, stuff, right. and Oscar McBride, and just some of those guys. And they're just fun dudes. Like, and Absolutely. just listening to the stories that that of the good times they had. Just like that would that seems like a great group of guys, you know. I think that would have been a fun era to play at Notre Dame. So yeah, sign me up for being part of that 1990 class. <laughs> I'd have been the low guy on the the class, like my, <laughs> whatever rank the class, put me right at the bottom of that class, and uh, I'd have backed up. Uh, I'd have backed up Rick Meyer and Kevin McDougal for yeah. a few years. And I'm perfectly happy. Are you kidding? I would have so, been like the seventh safety on the depth chart, wearing like number 78. No, I'm really, I am a safety. I promise. Yeah. You know, but yeah, yeah that, that would have right. been fine by me. Just like right. my dream job, and I think I've said this before, is bullpen catcher for the Cubs. Like that would be – you sign me up for that all day. I would do mm-hmm. that. I would beat, yeah. so. anyway. I'd still say backup punter or backup quarterback in the NFL are like dream yeah. oh, jobs because yeah. like right. you do nothing. They're not allowed to hit you, and you get paid lots of money and very low risk of injury. Hold so, the board. Yeah. yeah, that that would uh, that would have that would have been mine. Let's get let's keep rolling. Absolutely. Scott Yerbick, thank you very much. He says, What is your feeling with Rocco? Do you think he will get his shot or is he lost in the mix? When might he appear? I think it's going to be a battle between him and Lug at right guard. That would be my guess. Um, I think he's going to get every opportunity to battle. I I, I mean, it I think it's on him at this point. I it's a brand new coach, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and he's gonna play Harry Heastan's gonna play the best guys available. So right. I, I think that uh, I think he's gonna he's gonna battle. We'll just see what happens. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes we kind of for we kind of forget that that guys don't often play in their first years in Notre Dame, right? I mean, Ron, Ronnie Stanley started in his second year. Quentin Nelson started in his second year. That you know, Zach Martin. The list of guys that started in their first two years is kind of small. Right, Liam Eikenberg didn't start till year three. Mike McGlinchey didn't start till year three. Those are some; those are pretty good football players. Alex Bars didn't start. I mean, he filled in for Quentin Nelson as an injury in, in, you know, in year two, but he didn't start until year three. Sam Mustafer didn't start until I believe year three. So th- there's a lot of great players at Notre Dame that didn't step into the starting lineup until their their third year. And you know, Quentin uh, Robert Hainsey started as a freshman. You know, Blake Fisher and Joe Walt started as freshmen, and Tommy Kramer was a two-year guy. But like, the list is pretty long of guys that didn't really get into the lineup until their third year. I don't think Nick Martin took over in the starting lineup until right. his third year, correct? Because right. he was a 2011 signee, he didn't start in 2012, which would have been his second year. And so, so again, Rocco's fine, right? He's fine. He's going to be fine. And if he starts this year, great. If he doesn't. He's he's got guys that are at least two years older than him right. ahead of him, right? right. Andrew Kristoffic was a junior this year. Josh Lug was a fifth year senior this year, right? Like he's going to be fine, right? To your point, Vince, I think this spring is going to be an opportunity for him for to push, sure. not just Josh Lug, but I think it's also Andrew Kristoffic because even if he's behind Josh Lug at right guard, and I don't know if that's necessarily where he's going to be, if he's clearly one of the two best guys, they can easily shift him over to left guard. That's not going to be a problem. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And and so you know, I, I think he'll, I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be in good shape. And look, he's a good player. I haven't heard anything negative about Rocco. I think the problem and the mistake Notre Dame made is I, they they should have played him this year, but he spent the whole spring last year working with the first team for some reason, and yeah. then they just didn't play him at all. I have no clue why. A uh, hype train Kane, guy. Kane, Kane Madden yeah. wasn't that good where he should have kept Rocco on the bench the whole year. But it is what it is. And yeah. fortunately, the guy that was responsible for that's not here anymore. So we don't got to keep rehashing that. You know, he's, you know, Rocco, like all the other linemen, has a fresh start exactly. with a new coach, to your point, Vince. And if he if he starts this year, great. If he doesn't, keep working, keep it's grinding, right. because you still have three years of eligibility left and you get a chance to work with one of the very best and your time will come. And there's some guys that are making a lot of money in the NFL right now that didn't become starters until they're on the offensive line until their third year. And so there's no need to rush. And I, and I think that's kind of, but that's like the era we live in now, right, Vince? It's yeah, like, absolutely. if you're not a starter by your first or second year, it's like, oh, he's a disappointment or he's yeah, a bust he's or, bust. you know, yeah, exactly. And, and I get it. It's just, it, but it, it, it doesn't mean it's true. And in Rocco's case, you know, offensive line, especially it's, yeah. it's true. Well, and you know, it didn't do him any favors coming in with Fisher, right? right. Who is just kind of a generational guy. And it didn't help that he started all during the spring and, and it got right. that hype train. Yeah. 
expectations. Yeah. That's yeah. a great, the hype train. That's a great way of putting events. Yeah, It, it yeah. really accelerated that when it didn't need to be that way. Right. And I, and I think and that didn't do Rocco any favors. I agree. I think, I think the hype train thing is a great way of putting it because it set unfair expectations yes. for what he was going to be as a first year player. Yes, exactly. Right. And, and, you know, like I, said, I think Rocco's going to be fine. Here we go. John A1 keeps him rolling. He keeps him coming. That's the love about John. We, I always know we're going to have at least three or four questions to start the show from John. <laughs> Absolutely. He's my guy. And the thing I love about John is John always wants to talk ball. I, I, and I genuinely mean that. Like, that's my guy. It was great getting a chance to meet him and his wife yes. down in Phoenix. So that was a fun. blast. But, yeah, I appreciate you coming with all the questions, John. I, I look at my coin rolling. that he gave me every yeah. morning. I have it sitting right on my dresser. It's every morning. It's like reminds me to just keep on going. So, yeah. Uh, Anyway, and the pawn shop wouldn't take it, you know. So, you know, totally, <laughs> oh, totally, ouch! Totally kidding. I'm coming with the fire today, man. Yeah, you totally are, man. I was in your up. Cheerios. Well, I mean, I'm sitting there walking outside, and I'm in my shorts and a t-shirt, and it's beautiful here in Virginia Beach. And my wife's no, like, I hope it stops to. snowing before yeah. I have to leave to pick you up. So, yeah, freaking great. Yeah, it's, wonderful. it's all going to go away by Sunday though, because tryouts yeah. are on Monday. Just letting you know. All okay. right. Uh, <laughs> would Kyle Hamilton have been best? Had been a better rover than Jeremiah Wusukoromo? What's the difference between nickel? safety and rover and who does nd want on the field no i'm not going there i i don't, I don't think he would have been a better rover than, than jeremiah was the court he'd have been different. been different but look think kyle hamilton was a great player at notre dame but i feel like he was mm, no i don't know if i want to say this or not this is going to catch him i'm going to catch some wrath for this one i feel like his reputation was a little bit better than his actual play who, Kyle or Kyle Jer Hamilton? Okay. And like this year is an All-American based on reputation. This year, absolutely. I mean, he played seven games, like, right. like you know, and, mm -hmm. and had some good moments, but also had some. I thought he played poorly against Toledo and got smoked for a touchdown in a, in a key moment against Cincinnati. He's a great talent, but I, I, I don't, I would not say that his production and his play was as consistently as good as Jeremiah Wusukor Moas. Now, his talent level is absurd. His potential is absurd, and I don't always blame Kyle for that lack of production because I think you know there were circumstances that led to it. Obviously, the COVID year, which cost him an entire offseason as a sophomore, right. he got hurt this year, uh, kind of not always having the best talent around him the last couple of years. But the reality is, is no, I don't think he was a better player than Jeremiah Wusakortmoa. And as far as what's the difference between nickel, safety, and rover, so that's a good question. Safety, obviously, is, is going to be a guy that's off the ball, right? He's going to be playing more of a – you're either going to be playing the alleys, right, or you're going to be playing you know, off the hash as like a cover two guy, or you're playing center field. Essentially what it is. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's essentially kind of what it is. You, you, know, you may fill and rob behind linebackers, all, that, but that's basically what you're doing. You're an off-the-ball guy. A nickel is a slot guy. You're closer to the level. So technically you're on like that second level of the defense, practically speaking. So you're like on the same level as the corners and the linebackers. Linebackers for sure. Sometimes corners may be off more. And a nickel, as opposed to a rover, is more of a, a guy you're going to go to when you're playing more of a pass-oriented team. So like you may play it. You may want to have a nickel in the game when you're playing against USC, but you may want to have a a – rover in the game when you're playing ohio state right because ohio state runs the ball so much right. more and ohio right. state runs so much of the perimeter screens and stuff a lot so and then a rover is a guy that's more of a bigger safety a linebackerish type of guy where you know you're going to be a, a an edge player you're going to be a a force player against the run and the screams trying screens meaning forcing everything back inside blowing up blockers you know you got to kind of be a run defender first you're going to play the the, the curl flats, you'll you'll play some man coverage, but you're not necessarily like a, that guy's got to be a great cover guy. Now, if you can find a guy that can do all that, that's phenomenal. And that was Jeremiah Wusha yeah, And exactly. that's what I think Kyle Hamilton would have been. I think Kyle Hamilton would have been a great rover. I just can't say that he would have been better than Jeremiah Wusha because we never saw him play better than Jeremiah Wusha for a for any like a period of time. He had some moments where, I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's that dude. was pretty good. And he was a very good player. Don't get me wrong. And he should have been on American in 2020. Just not this year, you know. Uh, that was based more off reputation than it was how he actually played. But I, I, I hope that kind of explains it a little bit. And a nickel doesn't have to be a bigger, as big of a guy. It can be. I mean, last year the nickel was Tariq Bracy because again, you know, it depends on how you're going to use him. I think in a perfect world, Notre Dame would like to get a guy that's like a converted safety-ish kind of guy, or at least a guy that runs really well, which is why they like Impemba. It's why they like Jaden Osbury. It's why they like 
Um, I'm talking about the 2023 class. That's why they like Darren Gallette. They're all super long. They want really long guys. Osbury's the exception, but he can freaking run. Right. He can that flat makes, out run. That makes sense for it. Gallette yeah, right. can run. And Pemba can run. Nolan Ziegler can run. Jalen Sneed can run. Like all these cats can run, and they're long, and that's what they're looking for. A nickel can be Jade Mickey, you know, a, a kid that has some toughness to him, but he's a cover player. You're you're putting him in there to cover, and and that's the primary goal. But you also want a nickel that's good enough to where they're still going to do the perimeter screens, right. and he can come up and take on a block and beat a block. That's why I feel like even though that's what Tariq Bracey did this year, I, I don't view Tariq Bracey as the ideal nickel if it was up to me. When they go nickel, I'd put Tariq outside and move Clarence Lewis into the nickel and slot inside when they go to a three corner look. That's what I would do because I think Clarence is a better, you know, can take on blocks and things like that. And then you can protect Clarence a little bit with over the top with the safety and then help inside with linebackers more than putting them on an island. That's the person what I would do. But obviously Notre Dame sees it a little bit different. And I would also say just to add more intrigue to this particular conversation is depending on what defense you're running and what defensive coordinator you have, Mm -hmm. the answer could be different for all three of those things. (laughs) You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I I mean, you you gave very succinct and and basic descriptions of all three of those. There's people that play their rover differently from one team to the next. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So those things are always evolving. And that's, that's kind of the key there, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matt Edwards, thank you very much for the super chat. Do you have a sense for whether any of the coaching staff watches or reads Irish breakdown stuff? Not necessarily for advice, but more out of open-mindedness and about other perspectives and or curiosity about fan sentiment. Cheers and go Irish. Uh How do you handle this one. I, I know that I know that that our stuff is read, but it's not so much from a what you had mentioned, Matthew, it's more of a making sure that we're not saying something that they don't like. And, and by that, I mean, like, look, we talk to coaches and if I talk, if coach talks to me and he's like, I mean, this is, this is between us. And then he sees me writing in a story and it, you know, he needs to know that, that you can be trusted. It, yes, exactly. Uh, or that, or that I'm not saying things that are untrue or, you know, and I, like, I, I, so I know some of the coaches in the past, like I've talked about, I've told the story about Chip Long and, and, and the, the time he called me, you know, Mike Elko one time called me and was like, hey, just want to clarify, you know, he read one of my grades and he saw that I was, you know, I, it, based on what happened, it looked like they were in this coverage, but actually they called a different coverage and somebody had made a mistake and he was explaining it to me. And it was more of a, hey, just want you to understand what our coverage structure is like, which I thought was awesome. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I had, a, I had a coach reach out to me about an article um, a couple weeks ago. Hey, man, really appreciated that article. So it's more about, I think they care that, you, hey, are you being fair to me? Are you being right. fair to us? Are you out there saying things you know, that, that clearly are, are things that you shouldn't be putting out there? Because, you know, look, in, in this business, I believe if a, a source says, hey, I, I want this to be between us, then I have an obligation to, to honor that. People say, well, you know, it's, you know, you're, it's not your job to protect them. And it's not my job to protect them. But I, if they, if I didn't give my word to, that I would keep it between us, then they wouldn't have told me. Right. And so I wouldn't have got that information. Right. And so we, we try to honor that, but you know, I think that's the reason they watch. I don't think they, I, I don't know of any coaches that necessarily read it for open-mindedness. Like I've had coaches that, that like, so like coach long, for example, he wouldn't read an article for that. We would talk ball. Right. I mean, we would have conversations about football and I don't think he took any ideas or anything like that, but like it, sometimes it's good for you to be able to kind of, yes. I, I need to verbalize what I'm thinking. Driscoll listens. He can question, he can ask things. And so let's just, I want to run some ideas off of him. That that stuff will happen from time to time, but not often in this last, most recent staff, it didn't happen at all. Hardly at all. Um, so, but it, it is nice. I have a much better relationship with the, the current coaching staff than I did the previous one because of the guy at the top doesn't hate my guts. <laughs> like the last one it's one way to put it so, so far so far well i mean look I, I i give you all the credit in the world for being able to discuss things and you know not put it out there and and everything and I, I i give you all the credit in the world and when you have disagreed with a coach in the past and he yeah. has confronted you about it you listen and right. you talk like that, that takes a big man. I'm not just kissing your butt, but, I'm, what, but what I'm saying yeah, is. You know about one particular coach I had a face-to-face meeting with recently. Well, and I didn't know how far you wanted me to go with no, that. but it's, it's, Just leave it at that. And that yeah. and that's, that's exactly right. I'm just saying a, a coach you disagreed with, mm-hmm. you guys you guys talked you wanted it to out. Meet. Yeah. You wanted to meet. And I said, right. okay, fine. Yeah. Cool. I was like, 
when you told me that, I was like, oh, how did that go? Yeah. <laughs> oh, very but interesting. I give you all the credit in the world for that yeah. because it's very easy to hide behind your keyboard. Very much uh, so. And, and people Once do. Once I leave my DMs open, they all know my number. You know, I've always right. said, look, if you got a problem, this is this is the issue with the previous coach. Like, hey, if you if you don't like what I'm saying, then, then you know, yeah. How about you act like a man and give me a call and tell me how I've been unfair to you? Yeah. But when you know I'm not being unfair and you know what I'm saying is true, all you have to do is do what the last guy did, which is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, you did it, man. Yeah. I, that would have been the most awkward lunch ever. Yeah. <laughs> no, not, I'm, not my, I'm talking about Kelly. Oh, I'm my Kelly. bad. Like, that's why Kelly did what he did. You know, just <laughs> so anyway, moving on. Yep, yep, yep. John A1, uh, as far as uh as far as Colsey tech, how far is Colsey technically from being an impact player? A good off season. And that's the best way I can quantify it. So, like I could point out, John, this is a great question. I could point out like all the different things he has to improve on. He has to get stronger, right? He needs more weight room improvement. Because remember, he is closer in age to the current incoming freshman than he is his class. So there's going to be a, a, a little a bit more of a jump maybe from year one to year two than normal. As long as he's putting in the work, there's a lot of technical work. He needs to get some confidence back because of how things went this year. I, I think a lot of these guys lost confidence because they weren't being prepared uh, look- re- really well. Right. I mean, it, and I get that. Right. And so – you know, when you when you look at Dion, he 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 sometimes looked. People say he looked lost. I don't think he looked lost. He looked. He had like a guy that had no confidence in what yes. was going on and what he was supposed to do. And this guy's doing this, and I wasn't prepared for that. No one told me what to do in that instance. And so I think there were times where where that was true. And and it's nothing that a good receivers coach. I'll just be honest. Some of y'all may not like this, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> if you get you give me. Me, Deion Colsey, for this spring and summer, and he's going to be ready to play next year. And I'm pretty sure Chancey Stuckey knows the game more than I do, right? I mean, so if I know I could do that, then there's no reason Chancey Stuckey can't get him on right. a daily basis. And I mean, give him to me. I mean, like if I was this receiver's coach, like right. a trainer for a receiver's move into the Right. So I know Chancey Stuckey can, and it's just about what, what Coach Stuckey needs to do is first – identify where Dion is mentally. And when I mean mentally, it's, it's twofold. It's really threefold. It's one is his really grasp of what's happening around him, which is kind of what people talk about, but two, his confidence level. And then three, when, when you look at it is like, you know, there's the knowledge of the offense, right? So it's the awareness of just all the things. And it comes down to, you know, being able to read a defender, being right. able to read pre-snap looks. That's what I mean by the things around him. Then you've got to know the scheme within that. Here's what I do when he does this, 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 and this. And then the third part, as I said, is is his own confidence level. Those are the three mental things you need to kind of learn about him first. Then you look at, then you build on, okay, here's where the technical aspects need to come. And by the end of spring, he should make a good jump. Then you go into the summer and then you've got 25 practices in the fall. There's no reason Dion can't be a starter for this football team in the fall yeah. with that much time. And that's one area where, like with Dion and with with Lorenzo and with Braden Lindsay as well, even more so than Lorenzo, because I feel like Lorenzo showed up as a pretty fundamentally sound football player. Braden needs a lot of technical work. Dion needs a lot of technical work. Jaden Thomas needs some technical work. I not as much as Dion, but with only five scholarship receivers and one of which is Matt Salerno, like that's a lot of potential for you to get a lot of work in this summer yes, or this spring. And for Dion, especially that's going to be huge because it's, it's a lot of teaching and focused teaching. Right. And then number two, it's the work, right? It's just getting more work in. it's going to improve his conditioning level. It's going to improve his confidence it's going to improve his knowledge, his reaction time, because at the end of the day, being a great technical player is about putting in the work. But at, at the where you become a great technical player, because at some point in time, it just becomes natural. Mm-hmm. It's just like driving a car. You know, you don't really think about it anymore. You just kind of do it. Right. And because you've done it so much riding a bike, whatever, you don't think, OK, right foot, left foot. You know, you just do it. It's just natural. Right. Right. Eventually, that's what 
foot, football becomes, right? It just you've worked on it so much, you've prepped on it so much, you've trained your muscle memory so to the degree, your mind to the degree that it's just when this guy's doing this, I just know I'm doing this, and I, I didn't right. think about it. I just I just know it, and that's that'll reps. take a couple years, sure, but for it's him reps to get to right the there. But but he can have enough going into this second year that he can be an impact player. Yeah. There's no there's no doubt in my mind. It's about does Dion want to learn? Does he want to be challenged? Does he want to improve? That's always the question with any player. Sure. And then number two, does he have a coach in place that can teach him those things? I think both of those things are true, and both of those things are there. Now it's about just let's see it. Let's mm -hmm. see it happen. But he's got a chance to help out a ton this year, in my opinion. Scott Yerbick, fun one. Who is one football player from the past you would have loved to watch in person one before and one after 88 as the cutoff. Oh, it's easy for me. Ooh. For me, well, the, the, so I'll go give mine now. Before and one after 1988. So I'm, so I mean, I'm, you're, you're I feel like you're kind of, I'm going to go 1988. I would have loved to have seen Rocket Ismail. So let's go 1990. I would have loved to have seen Rocket Ismail in person, okay. 89 or 90 okay. version of him. Man, let's go after because I would like to see the sophomore or junior version of Rocket more than the freshman version of the Rocket. Would have loved to have seen him. And then the other is just because of I've heard so many stories about him from loose emoji over the years about how great Ross Browner was. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, just hearing those hearing those things is just like, OK, I would have loved to seen that guy in person. Because if he was half as good as loose emoji used to talk about him like that, it was a monster, right? And just the teams he was on and just all those type of things are just – he would have been a fun guy to watch. That's pre-1988. And and you look at the stats and then you just he, – you hear things from people about how great of a player he was. And and I met him once, and he was still big. I be, yeah. He passed away recently. But I met him about – I think about four or five years ago. I was speaking – you know, so you do the the ABC, uh, ABC 57, I think is it is, right? Allison Hayes, is that the one she's on? But she does the pregame show, and she used to have me on every now and then. You know, I'd kind of go in there and do, like, the pregame thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I had a chance. He Coach Mr. Browner was there, and he was doing, like, an autograph signing. So I got a chance to talk to him for a little bit. And just really nice guy, but just a gentle giant, man. He was yeah. like, he, that's a big guy. He was so much fun to talk yeah. to. We, did, we talked to him on the interview yeah. show. We have you on. on really it. nice he, guy. Love the fans. Like you could just see how he'd light up when fans would come up and get an autograph from yeah. him. And you know, but you just you hear about what kind of player he was. You're like, man, that's a guy I would have loved to have seen play. So he was like what 73 to 77, right? Yeah. He was part of two title teams. He missed a year at some point in time in there. But yeah, he'd have been a guy who would have been fun to watch. Uh, you know what? I will go with a guy that I met, and it's it, it I have a picture with him and it's pinned on my profile all over at Twitter, and it's Alan Page. Just because he was a great Notre Dame player, he's an NFL Hall of Famer, and then of course he became a Supreme Court justice in the state of Minnesota. Um, I would have loved to see him play and, and get to know him when he was a younger dude. Because as an older gentleman, when I actually got to meet him, I mean, just the the wealth of information and knowledge he had, I think that would have been a lot of fun. So I'll go with him. That's kind of an outside one. Yeah, and Alan then, Page, I wouldn't have wanted to watch. See, I wanted, I would have wanted to sit down and talk history and constitutional yes. law and, yeah, exactly. and politics and stuff the like best that. Interview yes. ever, dude. I, it yeah. was so cool to talk to him, okay? Because you, you and I are both history nuts, and of course, Notre Dame as well. And it's like, okay, where do we start? Like, you know, I, this guy is so, you have to be thinking, like, this guy is way out of my league from an oh, intelligence standpoint. Like, so far. Yeah. So far. Um, so that was really cool. So I would, I would have loved to see him play uh, as opposed to just meeting him as he got older. And then uh, after, hmm, after eight, I see. I've seen a bunch of these guys play because I've been like, covering. You know who my number two was? No, he said in person. So like, and I know you went to a lot of more games like growing up, so you've seen a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, did you ever see Brady Quinn in person? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would have been my number two. I started covering the team in 04. So yeah, the, yeah the my fall. first game, Evan Sharpley was the quarterback. Sorry. <laughs> Was that the was that the one where they played the USC? USC right? you know, first one? Yeah, yeah. Was Luckily, that. Jimmy Clausen was the quarterback. The next time yes. I saw him play, so that was nice. I, I will, you know what? I will go uh, with Rick Meyer. Hmm. I, be, I believe I've seen him in the past. I think, but he was my favorite player growing up uh, when I was a kid. I had I actually had a Seahawks Rick Meyer jersey when he got drafted by the Seahawks. Okay, 
Uh, and sorry if anybody's a Seahawk fan and everything that you're going through right now. Uh, but uh, I mean, what they're going through. They just got 87 draft picks from the Broncos. <laughs> I guess they did, but they also lost their franchise player. But, um, but yeah, so I, I'll, I'll go with Rick Meyer pro, post eighty eight. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here, here's there's there's some good answers in there. Tim Brown, William Wolf, Tim Brown and the Rocket. That's yeah. a good one. Uh, he Reggie Joe uh, Irish oh six eight seven Joe Montana and Reggie Brooks. That's a good one. Blaine Tiller, here's a good one. one. Johnny Lujak. Just imagine the stories, right? Like that would have been pretty cool. That would have been pretty cool. Yeah, no Julius doubt. Jones, that's another one. So I um, remember saying I was in the stands for Julius Jones, and everybody yeah. was twenty two. Yeah, Woo! you know yeah, he he was good. He was turn. really good. He's yeah. a really good player. That's a good question. Good question, Scott. Real good question. Uh, John A one back in the saddle. Does Notre Dame need to land Deuce Robinson to keep the tight end room elite after Mayer leaves for the NFL? I don't think they need to land Deuce Robinson. I think it would help. Yeah, some I think Deuce is a stud. Yeah. Deuce would be the, the Deuce would, would step on campus as the probably the most talented guy that they have, but it wouldn't be by a ton. I, I think Eli Raritan's really good. I think Holden Stace is really talented. And I know Eli Raritan was kind of the hot name last year, and he's really good, right? This is not a knock on Eli, Eli Raritan. It's it, I acknowledge they got they finally got him correct. He's a top hundred caliber player. They didn't come around on Holden Stace, and and I think Holden Stace is really talented. I think he's he's still a raw kid, but I, I think he's a very um, under undervalued, underappreciated member of that class. And and so I think those two have a chance to be one of those two. I think has a chance to be really good. I think Scott Bar- or Scott Barong, Kane Barong has a chance to be a really good player as well for for Notre Dame. And so, and then again, of course, there's depth. Like, do I think Mitchell Evans is ever going to be a star in Notre Dame? No, he's already proven me wrong once, so he may prove me wrong again, uh, which I'll gladly enjoy watching. But he's at least we know he can be a good depth player for you. He can help you be part of a room because. You know, I mean, like George is going to find out this year. You can't have three studs at tight end and keep them all happy. Yeah, I don't absolutely. think. You yeah, know what no, I mean? I like that. you need to have guys that embrace their you roles. Spread them out a little bit, right? But no, I think they're going to have plenty of talent. And then, of course, they've got Cooper Flanagan showing up. You know, who's already in the class. So, True. do I think they need Deuce to have an elite tight end room? No. D- do I think it helps? Sure. Of course. Anytime you add more talented players, and and I, I don't know why they stopped recruiting him. Like I, I never. I mean. I love Cooper Flanagan. It's a good football player. Deuce is a, is special. I mean, he is a really good player. Yeah. And Deuce is a completely different kind of player than Cooper Flanagan. Which is so why you can, can play those two guys together. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. it made no sense to me yeah. to stop recruiting him. Right. And, and one of the things I heard as well, they were talking about bringing George Takis back for a six year. Even worse explanation for me. <laughs> you know, it's like, like, no, that's a terrible answer. Like, terrible answer. And so you're going to bring back a sixth year senior that is going to finally start his first game as a six year player to pass up a five star tight end like Deuce Robinson. That's a that's silly, silly. But that guy's not here anymore. And hopefully Jared Parker, you know, tries to rectify that problem. So I believe we're trying we're trying to find out. Speaking of speaking of that, we got Ryan Roberts joining us. But I, we're going to have I'm having Ryan and Sean work on trying to get a hold of some of the tight ends to see if Notre Dame's getting back on some guys. We'll find out as of right now. I don't think we have any, we have any, uh, anything new on that. Correct. Ryan. No, no, I, I haven't had a, um, any luck so far getting in touch with Deuce. Yeah. So trying to, trying to, we just had that him. conversation like yesterday. So it's yeah. not like, dude, it's been seven <laughs> days, Ryan. Good gosh, man. I was I'm in not, Indiana when we had that conversation. No, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm it's, not earning my paycheck, man. I'm not earning it right now. <laughs> Everybody in this chat room knows that's not true. So, uh, you're definitely doing that, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get on that and, um, see if there's anything more to that. Uh, Matt Sokolowski, uh, do you see Chris Tyree as more of a kick return specialist in the NFL? I first, when I started reading this, I thought it was kick return specialist at Notre Dame. I was like, no. Um, and he could be more than that in the NFL for sure. I mean, maybe his role gets reduced to that if he doesn't hit the ceiling that I think that he has. Uh, but I don't, I don't see that being his future. I don't, I'm sorry. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ryan, no, you want to go and touch I, that one? You're the NFL guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to say that I think that he has baseline traits to just be more than that for one. I mean, one, and this is a good thing, Matt, is 
being a return specialist, man, like that gives you a good baseline to play football for a long time on the NFL level, right? So there's nothing wrong with being a return specialist for one. For two, I think Chris gives you a lot, obviously, as a pass receiver as well, where he can be that space guy where you can really manipulate and create some space for him and let him just go to work with that speed. So I don't see him being like that one trick type of special team, or I think that he gives you at least that baseline as a departmentalized back on third downs, that type of thing as well. But also I think that he can be more than that just in the run game as well, because I mean, you want to get NFL goes crazy for speed, right? And he brings that in in, par, in paramount form. If he's on your roster and you can't find a way to get him the football on offense, I think there is a there's a problem with your coaching staff. Not there you go. Yeah, absolutely. And that and begins it, now. Actually yeah. started last year, yeah. but you know, a little bit different situation. But yes, that begins now. If this coaching staff can't get Chris Tyree involved, because the one thing we know about him, he's been here long enough to know he's a worker. He's not, he's yeah. that'd be the thing is like if like, hey, look, we love the kid, but like he he doesn't put in work, he doesn't have a good attitude, he doesn't, but we know that's not true. We we know Chris is a worker. Uh, we, from what I've heard, all the running backs are workers. I mean, I, right. I don't think, you know, Audric estimate looks like he looks just because of genes alone. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's DNA is part it's of the, it, but it's the New Jersey thing. Yeah. New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh boy. I'm going to keep my next comment to myself, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I, I love it. He's bringing the New Jersey love, but but it's, he's a worker, right? And that is the New Jersey part, right? And like, you know, if you're most – I don't know a lot of football players in New Jersey that aren't workers. It's just been my experience. You know, maybe I'm biased because of the places I've coached. But I think all these kids are going to work. So if you're not using him, it's either A, he's injured, or B, you're just not doing this thing right, in my opinion. you, you got to find a role for him. There, there's no doubt. And he's just a sophomore. There's still at least another year, hopefully two, where he's going to continue to be able to develop his game, improve as a pass blocker. That's going to be an area where I think – more than any other, he to be an, an an every down type back in college and a guy that's a true third down back in the NFL. Yeah. Yes, you need to be able to do the pass catching things Ryan talked about, but there's times where you got to step up and take a blitzer, yeah, sure. and and take a linebacker, and that's the area where Chris is going to have to continue to prove his game. And I, I would say I would say too from the NFL side of it as well, it's like Kenny Nwangwa, who was a backup running back at Iowa State, who had barely ever touched the ball behind Brees Hall, was drafted in the fourth round two years ago just because of his kick return ability and the fact that he runs four two eight. Like that's why he was drafted. Yeah. So there's going to be opportunities for Chris Tyree. In my I'm opinion. really curious to see what Chris Tyree runs. Like I'm really curious to see what he runs at the next level. This one's appropriate because it just it just came up, but it's what we're talking about. Do we think that he's still going to return kicks at Notre Dame? Yeah, I, better. I, I don't see why. The, the The way it sounds like Dalen McCullough is going to use his running backs. I mean, there, there's going to be roles kind of for everybody. I think there's going to be a lot of guys getting touches. There's absolutely no reason not to have him back there returning mm-hmm. kicks. None. No. no, he's too dynamic. I'm sorry, he's too dynamic. Chris Basker, would alcohol sale in the stadium enhance the environment? I feel like we're missing the rowdy crowd at home games that the SEC has. So you have to be drunk to get loud and have fun at a football game? Is that what we're hearing? Apparently. Like, I mean, so in 1988, what was the excuse for how crazy these crowds were at Notre Dame back in the late 80s and early 90s? With 20,000 less people in the stands. If you want the crowd to get rowdy, number one, Stop making the, the game so expensive that it's mostly older people that can afford to go, number one. Number two, get your ushers to chill the heck out. And it's not the ushers' fault. They're doing what they're told exactly. to do. They're doing their jobs, yeah. right? So whoever's making those decisions, calm the heck down. And if somebody – and I'd have on ticket. If you don't like people standing up in front of you, don't buy the ticket. Yeah, stay home. Like, I mean, and here's the final thing. Put an exciting product on the field. Right, I mean, have a head coach that inspires people to be excited about your football team, right? So I, I, I just, I don't think like, and here's the thing. So, do you have you been to a tailgate? Like, I don't think people need more alcohol when they get in the stadium. They had plenty in the parking lot, Believe right? Me. So I just, I don't know. I've never bought that. Like, you have to be drunk to be loud at a football game. That's, I just, yeah, I think that's a that's an excuse. In my opinion, I don't think it's necessary. So, uh, and if anything, it, you know, the, the rowdiness that comes with selling more and more alcohol so people don't stop drinking and they don't sober up is you see more of the nonsense you see in the NFL, where it's like every week there's some, right. you know, some some videoed thing of a fight breaking out in the stands. I, you know, that's it's don't need pass. that. Don't need that. Hard pass. God, country, Notre Dame, 
barbecue on a scale of one to 10, 10 being Joe Moore award winners, 2017 ish. How would you rank the O line last year as a whole? And what is your predicted ranking for 2022? I mean, I'm going to try to be honest about this. I'd say probably a, a four. Okay. Wow. It was like a one at the beginning of the year. Yeah. I thought it was like about a, about a solid, a solid five or six the second half of the year. Right. So I'd say about a four. About a four. Not, I mean, look, you're nicer than me. It, you're it, way it, nicer than me. <laughs> <laughs> like they, they, they did their job for half the season. They did their job solidly against inferior players. Right. I mean, they, they did. And they deserve some credit for that. The pass blocking improved dramatically. Again, did the teams they placed think, yeah, but oops, Toledo wasn't exactly like, you know, the filled with the world's greatest pass rushers either, and they couldn't block them. So they got better, but it was still a very, it was still a pretty bad unit. Um, as far as the prediction for this year, I mean, I'm, I'm going at least a seven, I think is the, is the floor for this unit. I'm I'm hoping it can be an eight or nine. I think there's the talent for it to be an eight or nine. And obviously, as you said, you know, 2010 being or 2017 being a 10, it's got the potential to be an eight or nine by the end of the year. I don't think it'll be that by game one. My hope is that by game one, it's a seven. And by end of the year, it's an eight or a nine, which means to me. And so when I view that eight or nine is a top five to eight offensive line, right? It, it, so a, a 10 is one to three, you know, eight to nine is, you know, probably like four to five for eight or for nine and then five to eight would be kind of that eight range so that's kind of just in my head how i see it but four and then eight to nine by the end of the year for mm -hmm. what i expect 22 to be mm -hmm. you were nicer than i i was thinking seven to eight by by you know seven to eight throughout the season the range and i was thinking two to three <laughs> mm -hmm. like i'm not gonna argue honestly. with you i'm not gonna yeah. sit here and try to convince you no <laughs> things didn't four. suck that bad no i just <laughs> That's fair. I, because to Ryan's yeah. point, though, Notre Dame should be evaluated. I mean, let's be honest. Notre Dame should always be evaluated on what you did in the biggest games. And in the biggest games last year, this offensive line was hot garbage. Right? I mean, it just was. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be arg sit there and argue with you, Ryan. I mean, I, I miss. I'm trying to be nice. You know what I mean? I'm like trying to be. But I mean, I, I think I think there's and there's probably be some people in this chat that would agree with you, Vince. What 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 was your what's your answer to those? My initial was like three three and a half. Uh, okay, for last so you're like year. right in between the two of us. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, because there was improvement, and I, I give credit for improvement. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I I echo that. And then for this year, it was seven and nine was my was my range for the where things are going to go. I I can't give a solid answer for this year because I have seen nothing. From this group you know what i mean like talk to me in a month when i've seen a little bit of practice and we're not gonna see a ton right but i'll have a better idea but seven to nine i think is a realistic mm -hmm. you know range for where right. they could be going into next so year we're all kind of in the same wheelhouse it's yeah. not like somebody popped up what do you think the line was this year? it was a good seven it was a good seven no and it wasn't absurd like a one um yeah, but right. yeah it was not good then uh, tommy guns has a comment for ryan's comment about him him being from new jersey uh, he says, Ryan, that was as comical as Brian's Virginia Ballers opinion. All I'm going to say to you, Tommy Guns, is wow. Quentin Nelson would like a word with you over in that uh, dark alley over there. So it's been good <laughs> knowing you. It's been good knowing you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd be careful on that. So here, here we got – and then here's a follow-up to that previous question. Yeah, he says, as a follow-up, is the current talent takes to he stand coaching? Can our line be the best ND line ever in 23 – with Fisher and Alt as junior, that they could be really good. That's way. Too, I mean, I it's gotta it's see. Early. I gotta yeah. see one game of it first, and then we've seen two games of Blake Fisher and yeah, right. you know Joe Alt was a good player this year. But like, yeah, there's a lot we need to see. Like, yeah. there's a lot we need to see before I'm ready to go there. Absolutely. Um, and and again, I would never ever say anything is the best ever because there's so much I haven't seen. Right. You know, I never saw one of Newt Rockney's teams play. I never saw one of Frank Leahy. I never even saw one of Eric Parsegian's teams play other than watching yeah. a YouTube replay. So I can't tell you if it's a better line than that. I know that Notre Dame's had some pretty awesome lines. Yeah. So as long as you're in the conversation of like, I try to keep it like modern era, right? Like, how am I supposed to compare Josh Adams to George Gipp? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it just, it, it's impossible. So I, I think as far as like, um, it's like a modern line. It's like the last 30, 40 years. Does it have does it have the talent to be, you know, maybe in that conversation? 
sure potential wise, but there's a lot that needs to happen before we get in that conversation. You know, it's I'm just right now worried about them trying to be the best in the country. And then if they become the best in the country, then we can talk about the context because let's not forget and not just 2017, but I, I would contend that the 2015 line was just as good, if not better in regards to across the board talent. It's just that team, that team just did it in different ways. I mean, that was the most explosive offense Notre Dame has ever had, run and pass. The 2017 was a better run blocking line. But let's not forget the 2015 line turned a former safety converted receiver who had never played running back into a thousand yard rusher. Let's not forget how good that line was. You know what I mean? So um, that was a pretty good line. Like we just assume CJ Prozide is a great play. Hey, look, let's get when CJ got to the NFL and he wasn't running behind that line anymore. He, he didn't look like anything great. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that line made a guy that had never played the position into a stud in 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 one year. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. So best ever. Like uh, just if it's even in the conversation, the best of the last 10 years, it's going to be a really good offensive line. You know what I mean? Cause they've had a couple standout offensive lines in recent seasons. There's no, there's no question about it. I wanted to pull up this one before I had to leave because it's directed at all three of us. DM ND 13 out of the three of you who talked the most trash during your playing days. My guess is Brian, then Ryan, then Vince, if Vince did at all. But then again, Ryan is from Jersey. <laughs> I think he's nailed that. I think, I think he nailed, he nailed his guess. I don't Vince, know. You I know don't strike you. me as someone who talked a lot of trash in high school. Um, so I talked zero trash in football okay. because I had nothing to back it up. And I, I, I don't talk Wait till my like, next cut block attempt on yeah, the option pitch. I had nothing to back it up. I talked a lot of trash in baseball because I was a catcher and I could get away with a lot of stuff. And I actually got oh, thrown you were out. one of, of those guys. You got to hide yeah. behind the mask. Okay. Well, I didn't yeah. hide. I, there's no hiding. I got thrown out of a game. I mean, for nobody can. Trash. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I got right. thrown out of a game for talking trash. Yeah. But so I talked a lot because I could back it up. You right. know what I mean? But I, I couldn't back it up in football. So okay. I, yeah, I'm definitely third on the list. Yeah. I talked That's- a lot of trash playing baseball too. But I was a pitcher. So I was like, <laughs> right. I was, and I was there. And you know, you know how demonstrative. I mean, you see my hands during a show. They're like all, like, I was, yeah, it's, yeah it's just like that when I was younger too. Yeah. I talked a lot of trash. <laughs> I got, I got to talk a lot of trash. There's no Ryan. Trash. You want you want to chime in here? Uh, yeah, I talked a little bit, man. I yeah. uh, I, I only play. I only I only did track and field. I was a thrower in the track team, so like you don't talk trash in track and field, right? So it was all during the football time. You can't be that guy. You can't be like, dude, seriously, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I was a pretty good thrower, but right. like you just can't. Oh, look at that 150 discus yeah. throw! Like that's not me. That's not it. What you got? What you got? <laughs> yeah, uh, you can't be that guy. Funny. That's I think great. sprinters can be the only guys that can talk trash. And it's like as you're about to win, you just kind of turn around, like backpedal through the finish line. <laughs> you know, like oh, that'd be about the only sap. Didn't Usain Bolt do that once? Oh, or did I just probably. dream that? Probably. probably but, uh, <laughs> yeah. He slowed. He slowed down on every sprint, man. Like when he ran yeah. like nine five nine or whatever, yeah. he like jogged the last like ten meters. Yeah. It's like he was my insane. God. He was yeah. insane. But yeah, I think he nailed that. Me, Ryan, and Vince. I think he nailed that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so. Vince, that actually surprises me. You talked a lot of trash in baseball. You just don't, you've never struck me as the trash talking kind of guy. I'm not. Yeah. I'll tie you behind the mask. You're, you're somebody that's kind of like that. You, you're like that first baseman that's like, you know, Sean Casey, you know, everybody's best friend. Friends with everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, uh, it surprises me that you were actually were a trash talker. So I'm, I was. I kind of respect you a little bit more now. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not. I'm not. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Vince. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk to you later on, buddy. Appreciate you. Uh, Joseph Steve says, I am pretty concerned with wide receiver and tight end depth with numbers low at wide out and tight end for the spring, depending on players getting healthy and staying healthy. Is there any transfer portal candidates for the Irish? Thanks, gentlemen. You do great work. Obviously, really appreciate the kind words very much, Joseph Steve. I I don't think Notre Dame is necessarily in a portal situation for either one of those because I feel like the spring isn't the time to be overly concerned about your depth chart in this mm-hmm. instance, because it's not that they're low on numbers and it's not going to change in the fall. It's you've got two guys that you know are going to play that are out a receiver. They're injured. They're going to be back in the fall. You've got a similar situation at tight end. You've got Kane Barong is out. If Kane Barong wasn't out, well, no one's talking about the depth issues in Notre Dame. Then you've got two really talented freshmen that they think could maybe help them right away coming in in the fall. 
So at neither position do I really think there there are portal needs. I think the portal would 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 be something where if you find a guy that you think can help you and can play, go get him. I don't care if you, all those guys were healthy. You know, I know there was a kid from Johns Hopkins that they were looking at, and I'm saying, look, I think that kid can play a little bit, and he could provide some depth, and and he can play. So you know, hey, go get him as long as he's not getting promised playing time. So I, I, to me, I, I don't because the thing you got to remember about the spring is. The spring is a little different. Like in the fall, you need the numbers for a number of reasons. Number one, you're practicing every day. In the spring, you don't practice every day. It's every other day. And then usually you get at some point, you're going to get a second day off in there. So the, the practices are spread out. There's not a game you're preparing for. And you're not doing a lot of – you're doing no scout team in the spring. None. It's always good on good. And so you don't need – a scout team group of receivers and a quote unquote varsity group of receivers. You just need one group of receivers. Right. And so it's easy. It's going to be easier to tailor practice to the fact that they don't have a ton of numbers. Plus there's things they can work on with 20 personnel, 21 personnel to get a second back in the game that makes it easier for them to manage the, the, the numbers in the spring. So I, you know, and as far as depth for the spring, that window's already passed. Notre Dame has been back in school for almost you know over a month. There's no way a kid could transfer now and be eligible to practice in the spring. So if they're going to get anybody, it'd be for the fall. And I don't think they have that need. I mean, look, you're going to have the four, you know, you're going to have the three freshmen. You're going to have Braden Lindsay. You're going to get Avery Davis and Joe Wilkins back. That's six. And then you're going to get Tobias Merriweather. That's seven. That's not ideal. And you've got Matt Salerno, who's eight. That's not ideal, which is why I think that, you know, maybe there are some kids that they're looking at from a depth standpoint, but it's not like, oh my gosh, this is so bad. They're 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 totally screwed. And you know, and if they do get in a pinch, they they're gonna have six tight ends in the fall, and they're gonna have potentially five running backs, definitely four running backs in the fall. So I, I think I think they'll be okay. I, I don't think yeah. it's gonna be as big of an issue as as some people think it is. Well, I was I was gonna say, Brian, obviously the flexibility with guys like Chris Tyree and some of the tight ends, I think kind of alleviates the depth issues, right? Because tight end has a lot of depth. Well it, well, it will have a lot of depth. So having the flexibility, I think, will help a lot in that sense. And we have John A1. Will Chris Tyree have the most 20 plus yard runs in a season? I assuming he's meaning like in, in Notre Dame sort of history. Historically, yeah. I would want to know what the answer to that is. I would want to know what that number is. And uh, that'll be very interesting. I know Josh Adams set the record in 2017 for the most runs of at least 40 yards. Mm-hmm. And I think it was like nine, which is insane. Just yeah. like he had more. Uh, this is a, this is a nugget from from the great loose emoji. And I remember Lou telling me this. He had more 50 yard runs, uh, runs of at least 50 yards in 2017 than any Notre Dame back in history had in their careers. It's crazy. <laughs> and again, that was that was Josh running through big holes. Right. I mean, that was that's how good that line was in 2017. It was it was insane. I mean, he'll have a shot, right? I mean, I if the lines is it well, it goes back to the earlier question about the line, right? I mean, if the line is an eight or a nine, like we think mm-hmm. it's you know, like we talked about, if it gets to that point, then Chris Tyree is going to be a beneficiary of that and he's going to have a bunch of big runs. Yes, sure. I think so. I would love. I would love to know what that number is, though. Mm-hmm. I might have to do some research on that. I like yes, that. that'd be interesting. It'd be very interesting. This is one of those times. One of the many, many times I miss loose emoji because that's a text that answers a text away. Because <laughs> <laughs> the way Lou was, if you text him and something and he didn't know the answer, he would not be able to focus on getting any work done until he knew the answer to that question. You know, and that's what I, it's one of the many reasons I love Lou is is those that's type funny. of things. Ronald, Ronnie T'Charla, Ronald T'Charla with a super chat, buddy. Thank you so much. Just wanted to holler. Wish I could get the cartoon character sent out, but not able to right now. Can truly use some prayers. Go Irish. Hey, Ronnie, you got it, buddy. I'll reach out to you here this weekend on Facebook, man. See what's going on with you. But you got it. Irish Breakdown Nation. Uh, my guy, Ronnie, uh, he sent me a really sweet car picture that he that he, that he he drew, which is really awesome. And uh, he's working on another one, too. But uh, we appreciate you, bud. But hope you're hope you're doing well. Hope you're uh, able to get better and get in good place, man. So we'll we'll definitely be praying for you, buddy. And thank you so much for the super chat as well. Tommy Guns asks, how is Tosh Baker doing this offseason? I really hope he picks it up and is one of the five best. Ryan, this is an interesting one. Mm-hmm. Because my fear with Tosh is that he is going to be too far behind because he basically lost two years of development working with Jeff Quinn. That's my fear. Yeah. 
Yeah. He looked like a kid last year that had no idea how to play football. I mean, none. There were snaps, I thought, last year where some of the – if you took the 10 best tackle snaps last year, I bet you two, two of them would be – would have Tosh Baker in them. Yeah. You know, there's just some where it's like – it just like, oh, that's the guy that, that I had as a top 100 player. But other than that, he just looked like the kid hadn't been coached in two years. I mean, it was it was bad. And my fear is is that has he lost his confidence? Has he is he, has he gone two years with bad technique that it's too late to get him fixed? That that honestly, that's a that's a legitimate concern that I have for Tosh. Mm-hmm. And he's still young and he got a young body and he, and all that. But there comes a point in time where a guy just is kind of past the point of no return, and that's my fear with with Tosh Baker. I mean, I, I hope personally, Tommy, that he yeah. is one of the, I mean, because he's one of the five probably most talented linemen on the mm-hmm. roster, right? I mean, potentially. So, I mean, the idea he was coming out of that, high school. He was yeah, coming out right, of high school. Right. So, I mean, with that with that physical profile that he has and the size and the length and, man, if he's able to push the tackles, right, and, the, and maybe that makes somebody make a decision, right, and you get your truly your five best linemen on the board if it is one of Tosh Baker, like that's – such a huge bonus, man. Like that creates so many different possibilities. And man, I, I hope it happens. I hope it does. Cause I mean, I was the same. I was excited about Tosh coming out of Arizona out of high school, man. It's like, you just saw that length and that athleticism. You're just like, that dude's going to be a, a stud blind side protector. And unfortunately it just has not materialized due to some outside factors, not even Tosh's fault. Right. So hopefully he's able to push, man. Cause I do think he's one of the mm-hmm. top five, at least most talented linemen on the team. It's just, just has not is, is not developed the way that you would want it to be developed right now. Here's a cool one from JC Clapp. It said Marcus Freeman visited my work yesterday. He's out nice. building relationships in the community. Change is coming. That's that's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. And that's not surprising. And we keep hearing stuff about that all the time about him. Coleman Smith, is there a chance Samuel Pemba could commit shortly after his visit since he did almost commit on his first visit ryan what say you is there a chance i mean yeah there's always a chance because if they knock it out of the park i mean i think we talked about it yesterday right brian it was like and pemba seems like a kid that might you know escalate the process and not kind of you know just push it back so it's possible i still think that it's more like if they knock it out of the park and it's notre dame i still think he probably waits a couple weeks to just finalize that decision Mm -hmm. because he's a for by all the indications, he is a very thoughtful kid that I think yeah. is going to make a, a solid decision. So I don't know if he's going to rush it, but if he knocks it out of the park, I wouldn't say that it's a no chance that it could happen. I think you nailed that last part, Ryan. This is a smart, thoughtful kid. And that's why he 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 wanted to commit in the fall. He kind of had talked about like, look, I may take a couple more visits, but you know, I, I, I he kind of knew where he wanted to go. And at the time it was going to be Notre Dame. But he was like, you know what? I'm just not ready yet you know there was the uncertainty of you know the the coaching decision and all that and there were some other things going on that is like look i want to make sure that i make the right decision and he pushed his timeline back which to to me shows you a a, a kid who gets it this is a mature kid so like ryan said i'd be a little surprised if he committed like during or immediately after the visit unless he was looking to do that coming into the visit and i don't know if he's necessarily looking to commit coming into the visit Right. I think, and I, I believe Ryan, he still has some other visits set up, mm-hmm. I believe. And, and usually kids in that situation will say, Hey, I got a couple more visits scheduled. I still want to make those. And then if I have that same vibe, that same feeling after those, then yeah, I'll make my decision. So I agree with you. I don't, I don't, I would not predict it'll happen shortly. I mean, look, Notre Dame's got to close on them first. I mean, the, before sure. the timing of the commitment can be a conversation, it's like, they gotta they gotta get them to be that school right now. And I think they're I think that I don't know if I'm quite in the same place of feeling like they were gonna get him now like I was last fall. I mm-hmm. still think there's some work to be done, but as you said, the visit could be that work. It could be that opportunity. And uh, you know, it, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting to see how they do there because this is the first time he's gonna be meeting a lot of these coaches, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 that's going to, he's never, I don't think he's ever met Al Golden before. That's, that's the guy that they're, you know, they're t- basically he's being recruited right now to be kind of a linebacker. So he's going to have to get a chance to meet him. And so it's, that part's going to be interesting. And you just, you never know. You just, you just never know. All right. Sometimes kids come to visits and they're like, yeah, I wasn't really feeling it going in, but by the time it was over, I knew where I wanted to be. And, and I'm, I'm still trying to remember the name of the linebacker. There was a linebacker that played at Ohio state a number of years ago. 
It's like back in the 2010s. And he came on a visit. He was from Florida, came on a visit, and he Notre Dame was considered his leader. This was during the Charlie era. Notre Dame was considered his leader. And he just I think it was Etienne Sabino. I think that's who it was, but I, I can't remember for sure if that's who it was. But by the time his visit was over, it's like Notre Dame wasn't even on his list anymore. I mean, that happens sometimes too. <laughs> you know, you just and that's why I always say, like, let me see how the visit plays out first before we go there. Domer Grizz, what effect, this is interesting, what effect will losing Venables have on Clemson? It seems people aren't talking about that when analyzing them this year or are taking for granted their D will still be good. Who is his replacement? Um, Ryan, the, the replacement we've seen, right? I mean, he 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 coached them in the bowl game. I thought the defensive line played really well in the bowl game, or the, excuse me, the defense played really well in the bowl game. I mean, basically, basically shut Iowa State down. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's it's kind of like you're still you're still kind of coaching a Brent Venables prepared team. So I don't know that we can necessarily say that, you know, that that that's going to be the case. And just so you know, the the the, the defensive coordinator's name is Wes Goodwin. And I believe he began the year. He wasn't even on like the 10 man staff, right? I believe he was a back office guy, right? So, you know, I, I really don't know what to think because coaching the team up in a bowl game is a whole different animal than going through the whole season. And look, here's the jobs he's been, he's had from 2005 to 2008, he was a student assistant at Mississippi State. 2009 to 11, he was a GA at Clemson. From 2012 to 14, he was an analyst at Clemson. Spent 15 to 17 as the assistant to the head coach for Arizona, the Arizona Cardinals. Wow. And then the last four years, he was a senior defensive assistant. He, was not, he wasn't on the field. So clearly Dabo saw something from him from a mind standpoint that said, hey, that's got to be our guy, right? But, I mean, that's a, that's a big jump, right? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big jump. And we'll find out if he's a good coach or not. But I got to say this, Ryan, it sure helps you look like a good coach when you get to coach the D-line that he's going to be coaching <laughs> next year. You know, you've got a healthy Xavier Thomas coming back. Finally, you got Brian Breezy, you got Miles Murphy. I mean, you and I can spend the whole show arguing about who's the best of those guys and, and have good arguments to make. And that's just three of them. I mean, we can list off a lot of dudes – that they have coming back next year, they should have, in my opinion, one of the five best defensive lines in college football next year. And that, yep. that can make you look like, you know what you're doing. It, <laughs> let's be honest. That, I mean, there, there's talent, not only on the defensive line, but they got that Trenton Simpson kid, the linebacker mm -hmm. coming back. Who's a freaking nature mm -hmm. too, man. So, I mean, they got guys for sure. It's obviously a big, and it's funny, me and Brian were actually talking about this on the phone. Was it like two days ago? Talking mm -hmm. a little bit about Venables leaving, you know, and it's. Yeah. And it's, it was from a recruiting standpoint, right? Exactly. Like, like, that's where I think people are, are – where the biggest uncertainty I have is not just Venables, but Jeff Scott a couple few years ago, now Tony Elliott. Like, all the guys that were responsible for putting those classes together, other than Dabo, are gone now. And as I look around me, like, okay, Ryan, you talk to these kids. How often do you hear Clemson's name mentioned now? Uh, I mean, outs outside of Justice Haynes visiting at one point, I've never really heard. And, and I mean, Monroe, Monroe Freeling, Freeling a little bit, yeah. That's and Vizina, it. that's it, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, we're just yeah. – we're not hearing it. We just don't hear yeah. him as much. That's a good point. So yeah. it, it is very interesting. But um, what are your thoughts on their secondary talent, Ryan? Because I, I I have some I, – I had a discussion with a friend of mine the other day, and, and I think they have one good corner, but I don't think the rest of their secondary talent is as good as people make it out to. Now, they got a great freshman class coming in in the secondary, mm -hmm. but I don't love the rest of their secondary talent. I think it's been overrated for a few years, in my opinion. You know, I, I really liked um, – they had Andrew Booth this past season. That was a mm -hmm. really good player. He's going to be probably a first-round draft pick, and I really – I liked him a ton. But, I mean, mm -hmm. they're also losing Mario Goodrich out of that secondary, right, who's going to be a draftable player. Nolan Turner, who was not the best safety, but he's a, you know, solid He was player. there for nine years. He knew the right, defense. Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, he, was, he was the Hunter Renfro of defense, <laughs> exactly. right? Like, that's what he was. He was there forever. He's like that kid um, at Utah that's coming out this year, that slot receiver, Britton Covey. He was there for, like, literally seven years, right? And it's just mm -hmm. like, that's what Nolan Turner is, man. And it's, it's like mm -hmm. a beacon of consistency. Nothing great, but, like, mm -hmm. he's, you know he's there, and it's solid. But you're losing three starters. I mean, you have Sheridan Jones coming back, right? And I know, obviously, they recruit well, so, like, there's going to be some guys that mm -hmm. we're going to be able to talk about moving forward, but there's definitely not money yeah. 
guys that have played a ton of football coming back. So yeah. that makes you uneasy. Ever since Terrell and and uh, Mullen left, I felt yeah, like they've Mullen. had a guy here, a guy there, but never a great secondary. I just I haven't been impressed. And, I, and we talked about this going into the 2020 game. And I tried to tell everybody Notre Dame's going to be able to throw on Clemson, and they did. I mean, it, they they and they should have done even more, but we'll have to see how it goes. Our guy, Ladarius Martin, our Alabama fan, uh, says, sorry, guys, I've been gone so long. Mom's getting worse every day. She's no longer talking, walking, eating on her own, just laying in bed. We can't do none, nothing for herself, but she's still living. Thank God. Miss you guys. Hey, Ladarius. And he also asked for prayers. But you, you've got it. Absolutely. You know, your Irish Breakdown family is always here, right? Uh, we'll definitely be praying for your mom, man. Just stay strong and just try to focus on the good times that came before this. Okay. Uh, but we'll definitely. Uh, We'll definitely be praying for you, and when everything when everything gets back to to where you can come be with us more often, we'll we'll embrace you. But uh, just take care of your family, all right, and uh, and and stay encouraged, and just be there in whatever she needs you to do. And then, like I said, when when the time comes, just just remember all the good times, and that's 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 what you want to focus on and remember. But uh, we'll definitely be definitely be praying for you, buddy. Tyler Longbreak says, which players over the last four to five years do you think would have had a completely different career if they had not been injured or even suspended? Thanks, guys. Oh, that's an easy one for me. Yeah, <laughs> go. Kevin Stefferson, man. I, yeah. Whew, I liked you Kevin love Stefferson. love some Kevin Stefferson, man. I did, man. He caught yeah. me that freshman year. He just came out of nowhere a little yeah. bit. And then sophomore year, I mean, even when he came back at the end of the season, like he was, again, you just saw the big playability. He had so much talent. He ended up at Jacksonville State, and he didn't really do much for Jacksonville State either. So very unfortunate because I I thought – I mean, I didn't think he was going to be Will Fuller, but, you know, they had just lost Will Fuller, right? That's obviously a big a big loss. And then he presented some field-stretching ability, some big plays, and you're just kind of like, oh, maybe that's the next guy. And then, unfortunately, couldn't get out of his own way in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. That's the unfortunate thing. You know, it just – you hate to see it like Dexter Williams is another one. I'm really curious what kind of career Dexter would have had if he would have been able to keep his, you know, his head on straight. What, what, what is Max Redfield doing right now with his life? If he doesn't get suspended for his final year, that's a good point. you know, that's another guy when it comes to from a suspension standpoint, you know, and I don't know that might be outside of that four to five year window, because I think that would have been what 2016, right? That was come kind, of, kind of close to it, but that those are guys from a suspension standpoint. I would have really liked to have seen what Tommy Kramer could have done in his career had he not been so injured and banged up. Sure. Like, he was one. his best year was his red shirt freshman year when he was part of the Joe Moore Award unit. And I really had high expectations for him. And and I can't reveal it because it's not my business, but if y'all knew the number of different injuries he played through during his career, Ryan, you've probably heard some of these stories. And that's part of the reason he went undrafted. But guess what? He started games in the NFL this year, right? Yeah. And uh, he's a guy that I look at and say, boy, it would have been really nice to see what he could have done without all the injuries. Uh, Javon McKinley had some interesting – some injuries that I thought kept him down. I would have liked to have seen what, what Kevin Austin could have done in 2020 sure. whether, would be, had he not been injured. Uh, that's another guy. you know, Because you and I talked like there's just not a lot of film. Well, what would have happened if he would have had the whole 20 – 2020 season to work out the kinks that he worked out this year in 2021 yeah. um mm -hmm. that that would have been an interesting one just trying to think through some of the other you know guys it, that, that it, came it extends in. it extends a little past five years but Ter torian falston was a guy for me yeah and i was just would not have yeah. suffered that injury because i'm his freshman year man i was like bought in i'm like oh this dude's yeah. a baller and yeah. then just and that was the first bit. really good line he was gonna have a chance to run behind as far as run blocking because remember, Notre Dame wasn't really focused on throwing, on running the football in 13 or 14. They, that was an afterthought. That was a pass-blocking line and a pass-blocking team, and that's just who they wanted to be. 2015, Harry Heastan finally got his wish, and they started running the ball more. And, you know, I mean, even his first carry, he made that one. He was, I think it was like a run to the left. He made that first cut, it was, and it was, it was like, like 40 oh, yards, right? Yeah. yeah, it was like, you know, no, that was the next year. That was the 2016 against Texas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, right, the, you're, right, you're the, right. He made that real – it was like a maybe yeah, – like yeah. 10 to 12 yard run or something like that. But you saw that quickness and it's just like, and then the next mm -hmm. carry he's out, but yeah, he, he's another guy. So, I mean, we could sit here all day and there'd be guys that I would like to point to and say, gee, I wonder what that guy could have been if he wouldn't have got hurt. I, that, that's a fun question. Like those are ones that I need to see 
before the show so I can spend like five, 10 minutes going through the recruiting classes and be like, Thank oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that guy. You know, that's another one. Torrey Hunter's one. You know, he's a guy that suffered some injuries. He had that real bad break coming out of high school that kind of set him back a little bit. And as he mm-hmm. he finally kind of finally got his athleticism back around the time that Notre Dame started sucking in 2016, he's a guy that I would have liked to seen. Well, well didn't, um, didn't Hunter Spears have a career ending? He yeah. had multiple injuries. Like he tore his yeah. knee up in high school and was never really the same guy. Yeah. And then he had a couple injuries when he came to Notre Dame as well. So he was yeah. another guy. I loved his high school film. I thought he could have been a really good three technique. I thought so too. Yeah. yeah. And then they moved him to the offensive line, which is weird. I, I felt like sometimes Mike Elson had no patience. And there's some guys he would just write off really early and just kind of never give him a chance. So then Hunter was one of those guys, but he just couldn't stay healthy. But that, that we could we could have some fun kind of looking through and thinking of some of those guys. And I guarantee I will be on my flight home thinking like, oh, that's a guy. I would have loved seeing that guy. I'll tell you the guy, and this is like from the past, the guy that – there's two guys that got hurt in high school, and I really would have loved to have seen what they could have done at Notre Dame had they not got hurt. In their, they were, they, Notre Dame signed them in back-to-back years. 2006, James Aldridge, and 2007, Armando Allen. I would have loved to have seen Notre Dame with a, back, a healthy backfield of James Aldridge. And I love James Aldridge's film coming to high school. And Armando was never a natural football player, but he wouldn't have had to have been with Robert Hughes and James Aldridge he could have been that dynamic, explosive guy. I mean, it, it's a lot like what we're talking about with this running back group. Like, it, yeah. those two guys would have been fun to watch if they would have not had the injury problems that they ended up having in their careers. And, and again, it's not the four to five years, but, you know, obviously Malik Zaire fits into that, right, with the broken ankle against Virginia. So, Well, it would guy. have been there. I mean, it would have because he would have played in seven. He would have played in 16 and 17. Right, you know, because he he was 13, 14, 15, because he redshirted as 13. He yeah. started in 15. He would have been in 15, 16, and 17. So that would put him within the five range. So, hey, you got it. You got it. There we go. There we um, go. I would have liked to have seen what that 2015 team could have done with Malik Zaire quarterback. Uh, we'll, we'll take that to my grave. I, I I think they beat Clemson. I do. Because I because you, you think of the elements, the rain. You Deshaun could run, but he wasn't the runner that year that Malik was. Just wasn't. And I just felt like there were some opportunities in that game where guys were open that he just didn't hit, you know, because he was young. He was a red for freshman quarterback that was thrust into the starting lineup. And that game happened kind of early in the year for Deshaun. I mean, he was what three, four games into starting rotation. Like at that point in time, I'm actually going to go look this up. Clemson was first start was Georgia Tech. It was his third start. His third career start was against Clemson. You know, Malik would have had LSU under his belt and you know, Texas under his belt, Virginia under his belt. I mean, he would have had more experience and he would have, he would have been really fun to watch, really fun to watch. And the the one that kind of moving past is I, I, I was, what would Jalen Smith have been in the NFL had he not gotten hurt in his last game in Notre Dame? That's a little bit of a different question, but yeah, that's another one for me. Cause think about how good, I mean, he, he was decent from what I understand. Again, I didn't watch him a ton, but he was decent his first years in the NFL when he finally got healthy. And then just, but he just never regained this, this explosiveness that he had before. I mean, he was a he was a special, special athlete during his career. Uh, here's one, Dante Vaughn. What would Dante? Because in 2016, yeah. when they were all freshmen, the best corner of that class of him, Julian Love, and Troy Pride was Dante Vaughn. You and I, I think, we were talking about that the other day, weren't we? And yeah. and and what could he have been if he hadn't had all those injuries, the back injuries and the shoulders and all that? Because that kid's in, been in the NFL ever since and as an undrafted free agent. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Very interesting one. So that's a, that's a good one to, to look at. All right, here we go. Demetrius Rex, lucky lefty, had Brandon Wimbush on last night. Absolutely love Brandon. He's a great kid, by the way. And it sounds like he wasn't particularly fond of Brian Kelly. He says he wasn't given enough time to excel in 2018 thoughts. No, he wasn't. We've talked about this before, Ryan. Mm-hmm. It was get it was win beat Michigan. And then after that, it's a matter of time before the reins are handed over to Ian Book. It was so obvious that they were eventually going to give that to Ian Book. It I mean, they ran an offense the the two games after Michigan, they ran an offense that looked completely different than the offense they ran against Michigan. Because against Michigan, they ran an offense that worked for Brandon. The next two games, they ran an offense that didn't work for Brandon, and that's why it didn't look good. And it, and 
Ian was given the job. That That's how I read the situation. So I absolutely agree with Brandon that he wasn't given enough time to excel, nor was he given the opportunity to excel. And I'm just telling you all right now, there's a lot of kids that feel like Brandon does about Brian Kelly. And Brandon is too classy to just come out and say it, but sure. there's a lot of kids that feel it, Ryan. What, what, were your, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I the ending to the Brandon Wimbush era, I guess if you want to call it that, was – it was it was tough for me personally because I really enjoyed watching him play football. Man, he was a really mm-hmm. dynamic, dynamic football player. And obviously, there are some parts of his game that weren't developed properly, right? And, I mean, a lot of parts of his game that weren't developed properly. But he was just such a dynamic athlete. And I agree completely. I got it kind of the same vibes, right? That it it, it was like it, you you could feel it coming, right? Like it was there. You're just like Ian Book's going to play more and probably take over here sometime soon. So. I mean, Brandon obviously would know a lot better about dealing with BK, and you would know a lot be- uh, better about dealing with BK just in a, a general sense than I would. But it does seem like some people are now coming out and saying things similar to this now. Mm-hmm. So when when things start when things start happening over and over again, it's called a trend, and yeah. trends tell stories. So yeah, it's just frustrating that so many people so many people told stories. That's uh, without a, a better way of saying it. Um, I say, but. Too many people provided cover for things they knew not to be true. And that's what frustrated me for years is people would, would write things about, Oh, Brian Kelly's this, 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 and this. And I'm like, you know, that's not true, right? Like, you know, he, that's not how it went down. You know, he's doing this. And the fact that, that, that him and his staff could just basically just go tell certain reporters something. And that person would just run with it. Like not doing their job of like talking to multiple people. Hey, you're saying this, but let me hear his side of the story. Let me hear this. Let me hear that and do that. And that's why you saw the character assassinations of Chip Long. And you saw the the BS come out about about Phil Dracovic that was always BS, you know, and and you hear all these things and it's just like, yeah, okay, that, that's just how it is. But th- there's, there's a lot of people and you're going to hear more and more and more over the years about what really went down. I tried to tell y'all for years that that it wasn't what it seems and that they were winning at times in spite of Brian Kelly, not because of Brian Kelly. And eventually people are going to get are going to see that. They're going to see that, in my opinion. Rob Osgood. Hey, guys, what kind of attitude do you think the coaching staff will bring? Kelly, in my opinion, was like it, it is what it is. But under Holtz, it was a classy swag. What do you think the attitude should be? Thanks. That's interesting. I, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, when, when I just heard classy swag, that's kind of what I popped in my head with, with coach Freeman. Right. Cause he's very, like he carries himself incredibly well. Right. He's very well spoken, but he could also relate. Right? right. Because he's not, the, he's obviously a younger guy, but like, he kind of just has that aura around him. Like he's a, you know, he has that younger soul type of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. But he's got a classy outlook. So I think that's what it is, man. And I think that's the best of both worlds. And I'm, I'm thinking from a recruiting standpoint for a second, it's like, them going into the the into the homes of, of these players of these young athletes and having both best of both worlds right like we are professionals and we can get you here and we can give you the four for forty and we do all that type of stuff and we care about academics and all that but also being able to relate and just being like yeah man but I've been here like I played mm-hmm. linebacker on the college level I played a little bit in the NFL before I was injured with the Chicago Bears like I can do you know I know both worlds and I think the I think trying to hit as many vantage points is what you really present yourself because i think that he can both with his age his experience and his just natural personality i think that he puts off yeah i i think the thing is you're you, you have to be genuine right and i think what we see from marcus freeman is genuine he's a very thoughtful intelligent smart just guy that's not like uh you're not going to see him like um you're not going to see him acting on the sidelines like Jawan howard right uh who can like talk to talk in press conferences and and get it charming and all that, but then he gets on the court and and he's he's undisciplined and his team is undisciplined, right? Uh, you you Marcus Freeman is a, is that's who he is. That's why it's so easy for him to come across that way because that's just who he is. But as you said, he's also a guy that's got some confidence and some swagger, and and he's also a guy that that it's who he is. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to present who I am the same way to you that I'm presenting to my team, right? That's just the reality of it. And so I think this is a team that's going to have a lot more swagger. At the end of the day, swagger, where swagger truly comes from, isn't from your attitude. 
It's from mm-hmm. your ability to go out there and do your job at a high level and your confidence in your ability to go out and do your job at a high level. Because otherwise, if you're not confident in yourself and what you've been taught in your preparation, the swagger is a false bravado. And that gets shown immediately, right? Like that's been Miami for 20 years, right? Like Miami players, like they do a lot of this until you punch them in the mouth and then, they're, then they go running off with their tail between their legs. You know what I mean? Like, now, the Miami teams in the 80s and 90s, that was real machismo, right? Like, you could hit them in the mouth, and they're like, oh, that tasted good, and they're going to hit you right back, right? They were – that's how they were. But that's how Notre Dame was too. And so, yeah, I, I, that's going to be the thing for me is it's fun to have the attitude and the swagger, but you've got to make sure you're preparing your players every single day to believe in themselves and go out there and execute at a high level because that's where true confidence comes from. Because the big thing that the Notre Dame players complained about is they they never felt like they were being prepared the same way that the best, their opponents were, that they were never that their coaches didn't invest as much in them, not always, but mainly the head coach and some other select coaches as they were putting in. Hey, we got skin in the game, but it doesn't seem like you do, right? And whenever something goes wrong, it's our fault, not yours. I don't think that's going to be the case under Marcus Freeman, and it hasn't been so far. And um, I, I think that's where the confidence comes from. But I, I hope that this team plays with a lot more energy and emotion and swagger. I, look, and we kind of j- joked about this earlier. I was a trash talker. You was a tra- you were a trash talker. I have no problem with trash talking. Now, it's, it, as long as you know how to do it and yeah. you're not an idiot with it. Like, you know, you run for three yards and you get up and, you know, act like you did something or you tackle a guy after he made a five-yard run and picked up a first down. Don't jump up and do this. You know what I mean? Like, we see some absurdity or, with it. Or make a play when you're down 17 points and start celebrating. Like, yes, ugh. yes. Yeah. But that's not real confidence. That's, you know, that's just confidence is that, you know, hey, we know we're better than you and we're going to prove it. Like Alabama's players don't like, like they're not like Miami was in 1988 or 89 and 90, but they're a confident football team, right? Like that's a classy swagger to me. Like they just, they know they're better than you and they're about to go show you. And that's what I want to see Notre Dame be, in my opinion. Ben Karchi with Freeman, do you think we will put our best defense on the field? First, if we win the coin toss. <laughs> Thoughts, Ryan? Um, put our defense. Um, I always defer. <laughs> so sure. <laughs> You're gonna defer, they're gonna take the ball. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I just I'm I I I just kind of feel like there's not there's this thought that you have to do it one way or the other way. And I, I remember a couple years ago I went and and uh one of the years Bama won a title, like they, they started with the ball, like a high number of times that year. I just, I think this is one of those things that people talk about that I just don't think matters. It doesn't, you know, like you can point to games like the Fiesta bowl where it worked out really well for Oklahoma state to have the ball last and have the ball first in the third, third quarter. There's other games where it didn't work out that way. You know what I mean? Like here's the, here's what you do, whether you're on defense first or on offensive first execute, Right, score points, make stops. That's at the end of the day, that's what matters. I don't think I've ever seen a game like, wow, if they would have deferred, they would have won that game. Right, like, well, Alabama does this and they win. That's the Alabama would have won whether they defer, start with the ball or start on defense. But there's just some people that, that that really like to talk about that kind of stuff. I just don't think it matters a whole lot. I just, you know, I just, it's just not something that I put a lot of thought in, and it's, and I've never seen anyone give me real data that says that a team won or lost because of that. I just, I haven't, I personally haven't seen it, but maybe you have. Zach Martin, do you see offense adding another back? I guess there's some noise with Jaden Lamar. Thoughts on that, Ryan? It's obviously talking about I, 2023 recruiting. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think they're, I think they're very interested in potentially adding one, right? Cause there was mm-hmm. just one added to the board with Jeremiah Lowe um, out of Missouri. So I think the conversation is still happening. I think I think they're still going to recruit Justice Haynes out of Georgia. I think they're still going to recruit Jaden Lamar. I think they're still going to re- recruit Jeremiah Love, and mm-hmm. they're going to see how the board works itself out. Like I, I don't think that they're going to push just to add a guy, but I think that they have their targets that they would be good with adding a second back in the in a good world. Mm-hmm. I'm good with second back. I'm also okay if they choose not to. I just, you know, I. I like Jade Lamar. I think he's a good player. I just, yeah, I'm just not sure if he's the kind of guy that I'm like, wow, you've got to, you've got to take him as your second back in the class. 
I got to see more film of him. I know you like him more than I do, Ryan. I got to watch more film of him. See, this is one of the problems is when I hired Ryan and Sean is I haven't watched as much film of some of these guys because that's what they're doing. So, But that's going to be changed. I'm going to start putting on my big boards here soon. And I have some film queued up for the flight today, so that'll be fun. Nice. But I got to watch him more before I speak too much about him because I just I watched him a couple times, and I'm just like, I like him, but – you know, it look. I put that if if Cedric Irvin wasn't in the class, I'd say yes, take Jay Lamard like now. But uh, you know, somebody puts a crystal ball pick in for him in Notre Dame. I, I'm not. Let's see him get on campus this spring. When he gets on campus this spring, then then we can have that conversation. But until then, it's just it's just that it's 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 noise, and it's it doesn't mean that things aren't going well. I'm not saying that they're not. It's just until a kid gets on campus, a lot of that stuff is just okay. This is this is who he's feeling this week, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Freddie CO3, start, bench, cut. Oh, Tyree no. Diggs estimate. Just a fun scenario. Obviously, we wouldn't want to cut any of them. They're all going to get touches. I'm not cutting any of them. I'm not benching any of them. I'm going to play all you of ha- them. You have to play the game, bro. No, I don't. It's my the- show. I can do whatever <laughs> I want to do. <laughs> if I ask you the question, you got to answer it. But no, I'm just kidding. Um. Look, honestly, Freddie, I mean, those things are fun, but how, I'll tell you like this. Like, okay, I'm going to start Chris Tyree, and when I bring him to the bench, for brief, I'm going to also bring it, you know, I'm going to then put in uh, uh, Logan Diggs. And I'm also going to mix in Edric, Aldrick Estime, and I expect them all to make great cuts when they get to the second level. So that's my uh, start, bench, and cut. I'm, they're all playing. They're all going to be outstanding players. I think I really believe that by the end of the year, Notre Dame has a chance to have one of the five to 10 best backfields in the country. I I really believe they've got a chance to have that group. And part of it is the O-line. Part of it's going to be Tyler Buckner and what he adds or Drew Pine and what he adds. But I just, I really like the talent of this group, Ryan. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think it's very underrated and unappreciated. And I get it because they got to prove it, right? There's, there's not a ton of production there. And so I get that, but it's just, I'm just projecting. I just, for, I just really like this talentless group. I really do. Yeah, that's a really talented group. If I had to play real quick, though, I would say start Chris Tyree because that four three speed. I'm gonna bench my guy from New Jersey because I can't cut Audric Estime. Mm-hmm. I would not be allowed back in the Garden State. And unfortunately mm-hmm. for Logan, Logan, love you, mean it, but sorry, buddy, you're the odd man out. <laughs> and that's what's wonderful. They don't have to do any of that. They can play all of them, and a good team can and will play all of them, which is exactly how you want to be. Exactly. Tommy Guns with a super chat. Thank you, Tommy. Steers and, well, yeah, also for the demonetization. So I appreciate that, Tommy. I used a word at the beginning that might get us demonetized. We'll see. I'm actually going to go check and see if they've already done that or not yet because some one time that actually happened. We got demonetized before the show was even over. Um, but uh, I appreciate the super chat, buddy, as always, and, and your, your constant support of our show. John Keevers, which corner do you believe? I like this. Which corner do you believe? has the best chance to uh, to challenge and possibly overtake or split reps with Clarence Lewis. Uh, I think Ryan Barnes is like the obvious guy, I guess, right? Like I really like Ryan Barnes. Um, I think Phil Riley has a chance too, but I just like I, – I would like the possibility if there is a new starting cornerback, obviously Cam Hart, of adding more length, like to mm-hmm. continue to add length. And Ryan Barnes has as much length as anybody on the roster, so that would be my pick. It's a it's a good one. I mean, obviously, I think the the most obvious to me actually is Tariq Bracy, just because he's played so much. He's been a starter. Uh, you know, I think he's the one that would be the like, okay. Is he going to play more outside or not? I think he'd be he's going to get first crack at it. But you know, I I think one of the sophomores. I think Ryan Barnes. Obviously, I'm I'm trying to be a little unbiased here because I've been on the Ryan Barnes train for so long. I don't disagree with what you're saying. I think after Barnes. I think Villa Briley is a guy that I, I think with a strong spring could force his way into the field because he brings some of that that physicality that maybe they look for in the boundary. If they're dead set on keeping field boundary and then keeping Cam to the field, I, I think another guy that fits, that fits that boundary position well would be Philip Riley because he's so strong. Uh, and, and then, you know, Chance Tucker's a guy that I know the staff is real high on. I just haven't seen enough of him to say one way or the other, but I know the staff is really high on Chance. And they love his instincts, ability to run. I don't know where he's at, like recovery wise, because he missed most of last season with an injury. And then, of course, Jaden Mickey's just going to be hard to keep off the field. He just, 
He he has that attitude, Ryan. When I look at Jaden Mickey and I watch him play, and I listen to people, like I I had somebody tell me like when he's on my team, he gets on my nerves. He talks so much, but it, they say that in a, an endearing way because like that's what you want a corner to be like. Just you could burn him, and he's going to talk trash to you. You know what I mean? Like he's just that kind of kid. He has that just that supreme confidence to, that says he's gonna he's gonna outplay probably what his talent level is. And he's talented, don't get me wrong. But like like Julian Love. Julian Love was a better player at Notre Dame than his talent, in my opinion, would dictate. Because sure. guys that have the career he had at Notre Dame usually end up as first-round picks. But he was a fourth-round pick, not because he had a bad attitude or an injury. It's because he just isn't a great athlete yeah. for, for, for the NFL, right? And and Jaden Mickey strikes me as that kind of guy. He, he strikes me a lot as a Julian Love type of guy, where – he wasn't a top hundred recruit or anything like that. He's not going to run a four two, you know. Although I've had heard he's faster than they thought he was going to be, but he's just a great player because he's smart, he's physical, he's instinctive, and he and he moves well. He's a guy that I think could surprise some people this season. Of the guys that are on campus in the spring, and of course, my guy Benjamin Morrison shows up in the in the summer. I love I love Chirper as a cornerback, man. Mm-hmm. That's a big that's a big plus for me. I remember J- J.C. Horn when he was at South Carolina, dude. Never had his mouthpiece in, never. It was just hanging there. I'm like, mm-hmm. you know what he's doing? <laughs> you know what he's doing, sir? Mm-hmm. He's talking. Yes, oh, yeah. there's no doubt. And you can't talk trash with a mi- with mouthpiece in. It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, during the play, after the play, never yeah. in the mouth. I mean, whatever. Yeah. Man. Yep. All right, let's get to some more. Some great questions today, everybody. Tyler Evans, this is a good one. What is the difference between what is the difference between spring and fall practice? Uh, obviously, most most obvious is you don't have a game to prepare for. The blue gold game is not a game, right? It's a like a Saturday scrimmage in fall camp. Basically, uh, your emphasis is more on at least it should be on how to play, fundamentals, technique, conditioning. It's a much it's a much more important period for developing your identity as a team. Uh, how to practice. You know, if there's some drills you want to learn, you work on those now. If there's techniques you really think need to be foundational, you work on those now. There's some scheme stuff you start to implement. And and also, too, Ryan, the spring can be an experimental time. Hey, there's a couple concepts I like. I'm not sure what the best way to work them into what we do. Because what we'll, what you'll do is you you may watch like the Rams, right? And you see this concept they ran in the Super Bowl. And, man, you love the concept. But you're like, yeah, but we can't run it like that because we don't have this, we don't have that. But – I like the principle, and here's how we can adopt it in, into our offense, and it fits what we do. But there, there needs to be some trial and error, right? And and so the spring can be a time, too, where you can get a little bit of – from a scheme standpoint, you can get a little experimentation done. Hey, let's try this new run thing that we've worked on, that we wanted to work on. Like, I've always wanted to add this concept. I've always wanted to run a, a backside kick out, you know, or something from our from this, and let's give it a whirl. Let's practice it. Let's see if it works and just kind of see if it fits what we do. And you may say, boy, I love it. Or you may say, yeah, that, uh, that's not going to work, right? And so that's another thing you do in the spring because you can't do that in the fall because you got a game to play, right? You're, you've got a game coming up here in a month or a week or whatever the case may be. Uh, so to me, it's a foundational period where once you get past, like, get practice 10 of the fall, it's, oh, guys, we got we got games to win, right? We've got, we've got to start getting ready to go win some games. To me, that's the difference between spring, spring and fall, Ryan. Anything else you'd like to add to that? It's just time, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> spring, you have the time to figure out, like you said, not even my identity, just like what works for you, right? Mm-hmm. And, and when you're into the fall practice, like time is very limited. So you need to maximize your time. There's not as much, there's less of a margin for error in, in the fall comparative to the spring. That's my biggest mm-hmm. difference. Blaine Tiller, are you guys thinking about doing something special for the blue gold game? Well, I mean, I'll be there. We're gonna have a tailgate. Beyond that, I don't. We don't have anything special planned. Uh, just other than we plan on being there all morning and having some fun. And uh, I'll probably be in the stands. I know Sean will be in the press box. So yeah, that's just really all that right now. That's all we have planned on on happening for the spring game. So nothing, nothing special other than just tailgating beforehand. The Sunset Kid says, Brian and, and IB Nation, please keep Jenny D in your prayers. She has breast cancer. Thanks so much. Appreciate all you do. Hey, Sunset Kid, uh, we, Jenny D, you are definitely in our prayers. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, obviously, we're both husbands. We're both sons. Uh, Ryan has a daughter, you know, so um, 
we love our ladies and, and we know that's always like, I don't know with my wife, that's always like her, her biggest fear, you know, is, is that, and same thing with my mom. So, um, we'll definitely be praying for Jenny and, and I appreciate it. And I've tried to get better about that too. Like I'll tell somebody I'll pray for him, but then by like the end of the show, I'm like, was I supposed to do something, you know? And so I'm, I'm trying to get better about, about doing like doing falling through with that. So I'm definitely going to definitely going to do that. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Salty Virginia peanuts. Any news on Billy Shrouth? When do you think he will be at full strength? And when is it, is he likely to seriously compete for a uh, top of his positions depth chart? fall as far as being healthy as far as competing for the positions depth chart i think ryan the first thing they need to figure out is where you're going to play him i think this i think the army game i'm sorry it's always gonna be the army game for me the army game was sort of i never really thought i mean it was guard if he's gonna play guard of course he's gonna play guard but then i watch him in this in the in the army game and i'm like this cat can play center this kid moves like a center like he could play yeah. center uh so i think the first thing is figuring out where he's gonna play and then that's going to help determine how quickly he can get on the field. But uh, Billy Shrouth to me strikes me as a guy. If he, if he's a player that I think he is, as going into his second year, he either is battling for a starting job or some older dudes are doing a lot of this, looking over their yeah. shoulders at him. If he's as good as I think he is, he's one of those guys that that will will have a shot to get on the field within his first couple years as a freshman. Yeah. I, I think he's got to get more weight. I think he's got to get stronger. You know, there's a lot he's got to learn. I just, there's also really good older players ahead of him. Sure. But by year two, I think he's going to be solidly in the two deep, if not competing for a starting job. And again, but that's why I say if they move him and they decide he's the center of the future, then the answer is 2023. Sure. Right. And so that's why I say we got to kind of find, we got to find out first where he's going to play. And then that's going to tell us the rest of that. That's that's yeah. my thoughts, Ryan. He he um he struck he, he honestly does strike me a little bit like Jared Patterson. I know Patterson's a little different because he was practicing as a true freshman at left tackle, so he's not a a pure interior guard like Billy. But he just Billy just reminds me of a guy that is just going to start when he's a redshirt freshman. And he's just going to be a starting caliber interior offensive lineman for years, and that's just what he is. Like that's just what he strikes me as. So I agree. I don't think that he's a guy that's going to be pressing the issue during the first year. But I think that he's going to be a guy that's firmly in the conversation and competition in 2023. I agree completely on that yeah. one. And he looks like he does look like a guard. Honestly, I watched this film and I was like, I mean, he looks like a center. I mean, like mm -hmm. I, I thought that he he plays. I think that he has the skill set to potentially be a center. I think. I think he could be a guard, but I just like the ability to get up to the second level and just kind of the flexibility he plays with. Like he just strikes me as a center a little bit. Mm -hmm. Next question from Corey D. Who do you think will be our two starting two starters at safety? Uh, one of them is obvious. I, I assume he's thinking of Brandon Joseph. Ryan, I think it's you know from what we saw last year, and I would be shocked if the starters aren't Brandon Joseph and Ramon Henderson. I, I, that would be surprising to me. I think that that gives you the most upside if it is Ramon Henderson and Brandon Joseph at least for this season because I think that I mean. From a range perspective, from a coverage versatility perspective, I mean, that gives you a lot of ground that you can cover on the back end if it's Joseph and it's Ramon Henderson because Ramon surprised a lot of people, obviously, when he switched over to safety and the range that he has on the back end. So it would be great if those two were, you know, the ones that did capitalize on the opportunity. I would like to still mm -hmm. see Xavier Watts if he is involved in, you know, potentially pushing Ramon. Like I would like one of those two to potentially be the starter. And then you have guys like, DJ Brown and Houston Griffith that have played a lot of football, that give you like a valuable baseline as backups. And I, then I think that we're mm -hmm. talking about a really good safety group. If that, if that all shakes out the way it could potentially shake out. Mm -hmm. Irish for life says, Brian, did you see my message about the new Indiana coaching staff? Would love your uh, opinion on the new coaches. So I don't know all the new coaches. The only ones that I'm really familiar with as far as the new coaches are Walt Bell as the offensive coordinator and then Chad Wilt as the defensive coordinator. But I know about them in kind of different areas, to be completely honest with you. Um, number one, Walt Bell. You know, he did some nice things as the offensive coordinator at Maryland. He was thrust into a bad situation at Florida State, and then he became the head coach at UMass and didn't do a great job. But, you know, just because you're not a good head coach doesn't mean at a place where they don't give you much of a chance to win doesn't mean you're not a good coordinator. So I know he's got a great reputation. I just don't know enough about the job he's done to, to, to have a strong opinion on that. Chad Wilt, I don't know what kind of coach Chad Wilt is, but I've known Chad for 
gosh, I mean, we, we worked the Maryland camps when we were both young GAs, like his dad actually recruited me out of high school to Taylor university in Indiana. And uh, you know, so I've known Chad a long time, so I can only speak to his character and, and I, and he coached at ball state with a good buddy of mine. So when I was coaching at defiance, there was some carryover and he was a ball state. So we got to see each other and, and, and be at their practices and induce talk some ball, but he's a great guy, real strong Christian. I like Chad personally. I don't know what kind of coach he is. You know, I know he was a good coach, like at the, at the, the Mac level, but I haven't paid enough attention to Chad's career. I know it was at Minnesota the last co- couple of years. He coached with Marcus Freeman for a year at Cincinnati, uh, which he then used that to, you know, that he was at army for three years and then was at Cincinnati for one. And then Minnesota hired him. Uh, PJ Fleck hired him. So obviously he's been on a, an upward trend for several years. And I was his first defensive coordinator job. So I'll be rooting for Chad. I can definitely say that I'll be rooting for Chad to be successful just because I like him personally, but I couldn't tell you what he does schematically. I mean, we've only ever talked D line play, you know, and, and things like that. So, uh, and, and talked just recruiting or other type of things. So I, I couldn't really tell you what kind of coach he is. I can only tell you that he's a good man. And that's that's all I can that's all I can do. Ryan, are you familiar with any of the new coaches that Indiana has hired? Walt no, Bell, no. are you familiar at all with Walt Bell? No, no. Yeah, the just name, name sounds familiar, but yeah. I don't I don't know enough to yeah. have context. You you coached at Defiance, Brian? I did, yeah, for two years. I, I didn't, didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, I, we, had a, co- we, had a, we had a kid that went down the College Ground Showcase that played at Defiance. Okay. Years. Yeah. Well, who was that? Maurice Brewer, defensive okay. ends. He ran okay. uh he ran sprints for them as well. He was like eleven something sprinter. At that like was after that was after feet. that was after my time gotcha. at Defiant. All right, so here we go. Irish 0687. By the end of the 2022 season, how many top 25 teams are on that Notre Dame schedule? You reckon? Also, biggest trap game that stands out from the current lesser opponents currently on the list. That is a really good question, and obviously, we'll get more into the schedule stuff down the road but i like this kind of question so ryan by the end of the season because how just so you know this may not be what you you know how you do it but this is how i do i do it when i look at how many ranked teams you played i care about who was ranked at the end of the year so like i don't count georgia tech as a top 15 win for notre dame because they were three and nine just because they were ranked top 15 after beating Alcorn state and Tulane doesn't mean they were top 15 team. Just like I give Brian Kelly credit for a top five win when he beat Michigan state in 2013, even though at the time they were unranked, right? Sure. Cause it, it just, by the end of the season, it gives you a better feel for what a team was. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I look at the schedule, obviously Ohio, th- th- there's obvious ones. Ohio state will be ranked. Mm-hmm. Clemson will be ranked, right? Th- those are obvious. Sure. Uh, other teams I, I expect to be ranked. I think BYU will end the season ranked. And I think Boston College will end the season ranked. I think USC probably ends the season ranked, but USC has sure. a lot more holes on that football team than people realize. Mm-hmm. And yes, they got a ton of receivers and backs and quarterbacks, but their offensive line is still a hot mess. And their defense is a problem. Mm-hmm. Like Oklahoma had bad defense under Lincoln Riley with NFL players on it. And he doesn't have a lot of those guys at USC. And so I, I, while I, while I think that USC could probably score enough in a bad Pac-12, you know, I look at their schedule and I don't think it's a given that they're going to be uh, ranked. I just don't. I, I look, Lincoln Riley has never done this before. Mm-hmm. Lincoln Riley inherited a playoff team at Oklahoma. He was their offensive coordinator on a playoff team. He had been there as an assistant for several years, and Oklahoma was good before he got there. He's walking into a dumpster fire, and he's got to put it out first. I don't think he just walks in and, and goes twelve and two this year. I just he could, I guess, but I just I don't. I'm not predicting that because they don't have that kind of talent, in my opinion. And you say, well, you know, Caleb Williams is a great player. Look, we've seen quarterbacks be great players on bad teams before. That's, that's not a that's not a an, an unheard of thing. So I don't think they're going to stink, but I don't think it's a given that they're going to be ranked. If I were to predict it today, I would say they're definitely going to be ranked because they could go nine and three and be ranked. But their schedule, too, they play. Uh, if you look at USC schedule, they play at Oregon State, who's, mm-hmm. I think, a, a team on the rise. They play at Utah and they play at UCLA. And then, of course, they play against Notre Dame. So I think the, deter- the I think that the, whether or not they're going to be ranked or not could have a lot to do with the Notre Dame game. 
possible. You know, and yeah. and so that that could be an interesting one. Outside of that, I don't know. Like I don't like Marshall, Cal, North Carolina, nah. Stanford, UNLV, Syracuse, and Navy. I I don't think any of those other teams are like teams I would put in the top twenty five right now. No, nah, no. Nah, I I mean, just looking at the schedule, it's uh, obviously Ohio State. I'm with you on BYU. I think BYU mm-hmm. is going to be a sneaky good team yeah. this year. They're going to be yep. a lot of players coming back. Jaron Hall, the quarterback's coming back. They'll be a pretty good team. Clemson mm-hmm. is a givey. Boston College, man, is going to be a tough team. They're, I yep. mean, I know they're replacing their offensive line this year, but Phil Dracovic but that's going to be game eleven. Flowers. That exactly. line that they are going to have is going to have ten games under their belt before they go exactly. into that last game. Yep. Yeah. So I'd I'd say five probably at most if USC is able to be ranked. So I think five yep. is. A, steady number I, I i like that you said that about byu that that's an underrated and underappreciated football program. he's built a really nice program there yes really yes. nice program there they had five wins over power five teams last year that, i know well it, and it, and it's a simple fact of like they had a quarterback that was drafted second overall and they still were a good football team the year after like at byu right i would it's argue they like, were a better team yeah like their yeah. record wasn't quite as good but if you look at who they played the year before i mean how are they, they not going to have that kind of record yeah. But last exactly. year they beat Arizona, they beat Utah, they beat Arizona State, uh, they beat uh, see here they beat Washington State, they beat Virginia, they beat USC. I'm sorry, they beat six Power Five teams last year. And, and Utah was a really good team last yes. year. So yes, yeah, yeah. and they lost to Baylor at Baylor, and then they lost to Boise State. And and so yes, that's a good football team. That's and they lost to UAB in a bowl game. That's another very underrated football team. UAB has has developed into a really nice program. They really have. Who would be the biggest trap game of the lesser opponents? I think you and I both agree that BYU is that if people consider them a lesser opponent. Sure. If people don't consider it a lesser opponent, I think the team that I would say would be a bit of a trap game would be BC. I think that's a bit because you've got USC lingering. It's late in the year. It's senior day. Notre Dame has had some senior day clunkers in the past. I think BC is a team that people are a lot of people are sleeping on that has a chance to be a good football team this year. Who would what would your trap game be, Ryan? I'm looking at Syracuse for some reason right before the Clemson game. Mm-hmm. And they have that running back, Sean Tucker, who was one of the best running backs in college football last year. Really fantastic player. They have Garrett Williams, their cornerback, coming back. They have some younger players. I don't think that Notre Dame is going to lose to Syracuse. I, don't, I probably, they probably end up, you know, pulling a pulling away pretty convincingly at some point. But I think Syracuse is a, is going to be a better team than they were last year. And right before Clemson, might put a little weird of a layer on that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Blaine Tiller, any updates on the injured players heading into spring practice soon? I don't really have anything for you, Blaine. Uh, we won't have anything really until until we get a little bit closer and and um, Notre Dame starts releasing some stuff. But I don't have anything new uh, on that right now. David Carpenter with a super chat. Thank you, David. Hey, all long time no chat this year. Are there any teams on the schedule that you think will end up being a sneaky hard game for Notre Dame or the Irish? I think we kind of just talked about that a little bit. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna tell you a game that I'm that I'm that I think could be could be a little bit of a tougher game, at least early than people think. And that's Cal. And and the reason I say that is, is because just their, their, their offense is a mess and it's going to yeah. stay a mess, but he's built a really solid defense at Cal and they play hard. They're not super talented. They're, they're coached, they're schemed well and they're coached well, like that. They know how to play. And it, you know, it is game three. It's a game you think that you probably should win. And I'll say this, it'll be an even tougher game if Notre Dame's undefeated. Because I think if you beat Ohio State at Ohio State, you're not worried at all about Cal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Whereas if you're one and one, your your senses are alerted a little bit. Like, hey, guys, we got to take everybody seriously now. It's kind of like in 2017 when they lost early to Georgia. It's kind of like you felt bad for everyone to play because then you had a kind of a ticked off Notre Dame team that couldn't afford to lose another game. If they lose to Ohio State, take my Cal answer away. But if they're undefeated, I think Cal could be sneaky good for a couple quarters because, again, they're well coached. They're schemed well. He's going to throw some stuff at Notre Dame that could maybe give some problems. I'd say they pull away in the second half, but I think that could be a game that maybe is a little sneaker. And you and I think your Syracuse one was interesting too, especially if Syracuse is smart and they play in the Carrier Dome. 
and they don't give it yeah. away to MetLife like they have the last couple of times that game's been scheduled out there. Because if they, if it's in the MetLife, Notre Dame will roll them. They'll steamroll them. <laughs> yeah. Because it'll be a pro Notre Dame crowd like it was last time. If they play that game in the Carrier Dome, that's a weird place to play. Mm-hmm. That's a weird place for opponents to play. And we've seen some good teams go there recently and, and lose to some not good Syracuse teams. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's a weird place to play. So if they keep that game in in, in at Syracuse, I think that that's one that could be interesting. It really could yeah. get interesting. So yeah, good one, Ryan. Okay. Jarrett Hardigan, any thoughts? I'm going to let you touch this one, Ryan. Any thoughts on a Michael Mayer for Heisman campaign? I uh, mean, I love Michael Mayer. Best tight end in college football, in my opinion. First round pick next year in the 2023 NFL draft. When is has a tight end ever won the Heisman? Is my first question. Like, has that ever happened? So, I mean, ult- like the just going with the crowd for a second, right? It's the odds are obviously not in his favor. I think he'll he'll be a very important cog to the Notre Dame offense. But I mean, if Notre Dame's a really good football team, I'd argue that Tyler Buckner is probably their top Heisman candidate, right? If he's on that on that caliber. Um, at least the teams on that caliber. So I, I would say that it's a p- little premature for the Michael Mayer Heisman talk. That's a, it's a pretty big, pr- big, uh, it's pretty big projections for its tight ends. I'll say this: I believe Heisman campaigns are nothing but media-driven hype for a player. In the era of NIL, I think it would you'd be foolish as a program not to take a kid or two that you think can create buzz. Not He's not going to win the Heisman, right? He's a tight end. He's not going to win the Heisman. He's not going to have a chance to win the Heisman Trophy. But in this era of NIL, it doesn't mean that starting a hype campaign for your best player, perceived best player, doesn't make sense in that you can maybe work in that hype can then – see, this is how a school can legally sort of push NIL. You create the Heisman buzz. You're sending all this hype about Michael Mayer and what he did and you know the number – that all these things – all of a sudden, companies are like, "Hey, I want to get a part. I want to be part of that." Notre Dame's pushing this kid, you know, for Heisman and stuff like that. I want to get on that, and so he gets a sponsor. He gets this, he gets that, and then next thing you know, you're selling recruits. Hey, you know how much money Michael Mayer got last year? You know what I mean? Imagine what you, as a quarterback or a running back or receiver, could get if we were pushing you for a Heisman Trophy campaign. I think they should do it because he's their most. I would argue he's their most recognizable player, don't you? And I would do the same thing with Isaiah Foskey for whatever the big awards were on, are on defense. I think it makes it'd be foolish not to, in my opinion, to do that. And in this era of NIL, that's how a program like Notre Dame can legally create hype and buzz about a kid that then makes company. Because look, when Notre Dame does something, people pay attention. It's still Notre Dame. You know, so Ryan, I agree with everything you said about the legitimacy of a Heisman Trophy campaign for Michael Mayer. Ain't happening. But from a business standpoint, I think there's some merit to at least doing that during the offseason. You know what I mean? In the mate early in the season. And then if Tyler Buckner blows up or if somebody else blows up that's more a legitimate Heisman Trophy contender, then you kind of shift gears <laughs> to that guy. But in the offseason, it makes no sense. It makes it would make no sense to not push a guy like Michael Mayer just for the, the NIL aspects of it. That's my that's my takeaway. Does that make sense kind of where I'm coming from, Ryan? Like I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying because you're speaking practically sure. and you're absolutely right. I'm speaking more of a we have to look at these kind of things a little differently in this in, a, in this NIL era. That's I think we should. Sense. I think we should start the Michael Mayer John Mackey Awards campaign, right? Like, yeah. Let's start there. I don't know how many. Goes. I don't know how many people are. See, again, you're still looking at it practically. I'm looking at it from a business standpoint, right? No matter who, if Notre Dame started hyping Blake Fisher, there are going to be people that are like, "Hey, let's get on this thing," right? And so, Out, Outland Trophy. It, yeah. The the guy on your roster that you have the best chance of of making a lot of money this year, nil wise, is Michael Mayer, in my opinion. As of right now, him and Fosky. Sure. So that's why yeah. I say those are the two guys that I would push, because then yeah. you can sell that on the recruiting trail. Like, hey, do you know how much money Michael Mayer made last year on nil stuff? And he's a tight end, and that's where it's like your point. Like, he's a tight end, right? You know what I mean? And you know, it'd be interesting. Frank G with a super chat. Thank you, Frank. And we got to wrap up soon because I've got to start heading to the airport. So I'm going to get to a few of these. Um, off top, thank you for the super chat, Frank. Off top, a question out of all the head coaching changes, which one is the biggest head scratcher for you guys? Love the show. I hate to say it, Ryan, because it's going to sound petty, but Brian Kelly to LSU was the biggest head scratcher to me. And, and, and I don't even mean that as a let, let's just work with the assumption of Brian Kelly is what the media thinks he is, right? Uh huh. He's a he's a Massachusetts 
guy that coached the mid the north and the midwest his whole career who is going to the bayou right he's got, like he's, he's got a great family though the fit the family the <laughs> yeah. fit just doesn't make a lot of sense to me like i'm i'm just i'm i'm not even taking shots at it. i'm just being practically speaking that didn't make a lot of sense to me like the that fit there like that's the guy you're going to throw 90 some million dollars at like that that guy that was probably yeah. for me one of the biggest head scratchers of this of this coaching, this coaching yeah. hire cycle. Yeah, I'm looking through some of the coaching hires. There's honestly a couple head scratchers, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, I think a one big one. It's not like a, a big name program, but like UMass hiring Don Brown as their head coach. So it's just kind of yeah. like it's going back to the past. <laughs> Guy that had yeah. done it before. As long as that comes with going back to FCS, it would make a lot of sense. Sure, which is what UMass needs to do. They need to go back to. They need That's to go back to. Very FCA. solid point. That's a very solid point. Yeah, bro. yeah. So I'm just going like Dan Landing at Oregon was one that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Like yeah. it just, it you know, it's like really not, the, like um, who was it? Jim Moore Jr. to UConn. Just yeah, like, that didn't make okay. sense for Jim Moore Jr. Was, <laughs> right, I learned right. this when I interviewed him. He's not Jim Moore Jr. I learned that he's not actually Jim Moore Jr. But uh, uh, I got corrected on that. But yeah, that like what. You want to get back into coaching? That's the job you'd take, like UConn. Like, yeah, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Really, didn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, Washington hiring Kellen DeBoer, I thought was a good hire. Mike Elko going to Duke, I thought was a really good hire. Sure, Th- yep. there was there was a lot of good hires this off season. I don't think a lot of them are, are, are ones that I would necessarily complain about because some of them I just don't don't care. Like, oh, I don't care who. Yeah, no, I I, I, I like the DeBoer one. I really like yeah. the, the DeBoer. Yeah, I thought that was a good hire. I, I thought Mark Cristobal to Miami was a great hire. You know, and Billy Napier was a good hire. I love Fresno hiring Jeff Tedford. I, I really like Jeff Tedford. I mean, I totally get why Oklahoma hired Brent Venables. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but it made sense, you know, when, when you look at who was out there at the time. So, I mean, it, yeah. there weren't a whole lot of – I just the, – the Kelly fit for me is just – it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. All right. Get down here to a few more of these – we got the talk trash one. I'm trying to find just a couple more. Uh, we got some super chats here from Casa Hodge. Thank you for that. What have you heard, if anything, what's stopping Rocco Spindler from being a starter this upcoming season? Youth. That's really it, guys. I mean, he's young. He's a young kid. He's, as we talked about earlier, some kids, there's a lot of great players that, that, that we could point to as offensive linemen that didn't start till their third year in college. I mean, just a lot, right? Including some All-Americans in Notre Dame that were top draft picks and Mike McGlinchey being one. You know, Nick Martin was one. Liam Eikenberg was one. Just it's just there's good players ahead of him, and he's young. I mean, that's that's really the only thing to me that I've heard. Other than I mean, that's it. That's it. Richard Maltby with a super chat. Thank you, Richard. Happy Friday, guys. Excited for spring to get started. Projected starting five, six man on the line. Also two deep for each safety position. Cheers. I'm gonna take first crack at the line, Ryan. Mm-hmm. Left to right, I'm gonna go Alt, Christophic. And he, did he say spring? Okay, so we're going to not go spring. We're just going to call it the fall. Patterson at center, Lug, Fisher. That's my five, and my sixth is going to be – I'm going to go Rocco as my sixth. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm going to yeah. go Rocco as my sixth. Mm-hmm. Well, how about you for the O-line? No, I'm, I have the same five. Maybe throw Tosh Baker in there as – you know, a guy that backs up both that tackle spots potentially, but Rocco Spindler backs up multiple guard spots and – I'm we'll be shocked if you get some center reps too. So yeah, T- too deep for safety. This is going to be a battle because this one's a little harder to to figure out. Obviously, we're, you're going to see you're going to see the guys we talked about earlier. You're going to see uh, Ramon Henderson and Brandon Joseph, mm-hmm. and I think you're going to see Xavier Watts. And then after that, it's are, do they go five deep with both of the veterans playing, or yeah. does one of those veterans got to get left out? And that's Houston Griffith and DJ Brown. I think I think that is going to be a little bit tougher for me to determine if I have to go too deep, which means four guys. You know that that's going to be the interesting one. Yeah, well, I mean, I would I would look at Brandon Joseph, like you said. I I think a a combination of Ramon Henderson and Xavier Watts at the other safety spot, and then we figure out DJ Brown or Houston Griffith. I don't know what the repercussions would be of that though. If there's a guy left out, like would they transfer? Would they be okay right. with that role? Like that's. That's a tough conversation to have, but that's, I think that again, Ramon Henderson and Xavier Watts need to play. Like they're just too talented not to play. And right. then Brandon, you, you brought in Brandon Joseph for a reason, right? Like he's, right. he's that guy. So, right. 
Right. And that's, that is where we're going to have to leave it today, folks. Cause I have to hustle and get out of here and get to my flight. So I've got a, about a 30 minute drive and I got to finish packing. So, uh, Fun show, Ryan. Thanks for this. Vince, obviously, it was a lot of fun having all three of us on there, everybody. Before you leave, folks, remember, you've got to hit the like button. You've got to hit the subscribe button. you got to hit the notification bell. Share this podcast. Sign up for the message boards. Yeah, like four or five people sign up during the show. Love it. Everybody sign up. We've got a lot of good conversation going on. Uh, we'll have tons of recruiting updates as Ryan can, and Sean continue to kick it, uh, kick butt on the recruiting trail. And um, I'll bring any intel that I can get. Coaches are Kind of getting back from spring break this weekend. So uh, we'll, we'll try to get get as much as we can here before spring. So make sure you check that out. So uh, for Ryan, I'm Brian. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining us on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.